Hey everyone, and welcome to the best of January 2023. Almost five hours of horror stories. If at any point you feel this video is deserving of a like, please be sure to drop one. Let's see if we can reach 1300 likes on this one. Subscribing if you are new is also very much appreciated as I post videos just like this one all of the time. Sit back, grab a coffee, whatever it is that you do to relax, enjoy, tell someone you love them, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. As anyone who is or has been the nerdy kid growing up can attest to, you can't help but assume the worst when the biggest bloke in class suddenly walks up to you. It took him calling me by name several times for me to stop pretending like I was reading the blank pages of my notebook. Instead of barraging me with all the usual insults about my glasses, my clothes, or my bowl cut, however, he just grinned down at me and asked, Oh, hey, newbie, you play caps? I shook my head. My folks and I had just moved to town barely a month ago, so I obviously wasn't familiar with the local trends. Bottle caps, or just caps, was apparently an infamous kids game that had recently made its resurgence and was being played across the entire school. I say infamous because many parents saw it as a gateway into subsequent gambling habits and actively encouraged teachers to be on the lookout for students participating in it. Ironically, that only added to the game's sort of underground appeal. Their concerns weren't unfounded, as kids would often be coaxed by their peers into wagering their allowances or other possessions. The rules are deceptively simple. At the start of a game, each player grabs four random bottle caps from the set. Each cap would have a number written on the inside of it, showing the amount of points said cap is worth. The numbers can be 5, 10, 15, 20, or 25. The players then take turns guessing how many points the other has. Every time they are wrong, their opponent must tell them to guess either higher or lower during their next turn. If a player suspects that they are being misdirected, they call their opponent out. A player wins by either guessing the exact number of points their opponent has, catching them lying, or being called out for lying when they actually weren't. Regardless of the outcome, both players flip their caps at the end of the game, revealing their score and proving that they haven't cheated. Needless to say, I lost my lunch money that day, but a few pounds was a small price for the thrill of taking part in something I wasn't supposed to. That's how it started. After a few weeks, my own parents could hardly recognize me. I had stopped studying, which my grades inevitably began to reflect. The only reason I went to school was to play caps with the lads probably beginning to suspect what was going on, my mom started packing my lunch instead of giving me money. Unfortunately, that only resulted in me sneaking stuff out of the house that I could gamble with instead. I was much too young to grasp the concept of serious addiction, let alone realize that I was spiraling head first towards it. The others convinced me to stop attending classes altogether. We'd spend our weekdays behind an abandoned gym, where we'd smoke, draw on the walls, and of course, play caps. But there was also another reason we went there. Once in a while, this old man from across the street would come down and pay us a visit. In hindsight, the guy was clearly unwell. He was grossly malnourished, somehow appearing skinnier and skinnier each time we saw him. His face was covered in scabs and lesions, and his eyes were perpetually bloodshot. He never gave us his name, so we just called him Mr. Seg, on account of his propensity for wearing absurdly oversized jumpers. According to him, he and his friends were the ones who originally came up with our favorite activity. Back when they were around our age, 
Usually he'd just sit there and watch us play for a few hours before going back inside. On occasion, however, he'd challenge one of us to a game, always brandishing the same crumpled 50 euro note and promising it to whoever beats him. It was an obscene amount of money from the perspective of a 12 year old back in the early 90s. Not that we'd ever know. You would think that, for a game so reliant on chance, one of us was bound to get lucky eventually. But the old guy always managed to weasel out in the end. Every time it seemed like he was about to lose, he'd suddenly make a random guess which just so happened to be the correct one. We were convinced that he was cheating, but we couldn't figure out how. The bottle caps we used were all the same brand of coke. There shouldn't have been any way of differentiating between them. He was either being helped by someone or had one hell of an eye for detail. Perhaps it was time that we tilted the odds in our favor a little bit as well. Cheating at caps is considered a local taboo, and a reliable way of getting your teeth kicked in if caught. Given the circumstances, however, we figured that turnabout is a fair play. A functional set consists of four caps from each of the five respective values totaling at 20 per set. Giving each of them some sort of distinguishing mark would have been too obvious, especially if old Mr. Seg really was that perceptive. To mine and everyone else's surprise, it was I who came up with the idea we eventually ended up going with. The plan was to make a new rigged set made of 16 caps worth the same amount of points. In this case, 10, and only 4 of a different one, 15. Only those 4 would be marked in some ideally inconspicuous way so that we could search them out from the rest. The idea was that you'd always know what your opponent has regardless of what they pick, while also being able to ensure that there aren't more than 4 caps of a single value between you two, since that would have given it away. The trap was set. All that was left now was for our guest of honor to make his appearance. Mr. Seg showed up late the following afternoon. He greeted us with the wave and assumed his usual sitting spot, an improvised bench made out of plywood and a few cinder blocks for support. Cooper, the oldest kid in our group, didn't seem keen on waiting for a challenge to be extended. He strode up to the old man and demanded the rematch that he felt he was owed. Mr. Seg offered him a passive, neutral smile, then shrugged his shoulders and joined us at the table. The rest of us took a few steps back, having just replaced the real set with the trick one, and trying not to look too obviously giddy about it. The bottle caps were laid out between them, even from a glance, I could already tell that the four marked ones from the rest. Three of them were lightly scratched in different places while the fourth had parts of its logo smeared. We tried to make the imperfections look as benign and accidental as possible. As per the rules, both players took turns shuffling the order before selecting their caps. Cooper waited for his venerable opponent to pick first. I could tell that the old man had three tens and a fifteen. In response, Cooper quickly snatched the remaining fifteens and one ten. Both checked their caps, or pretended to in the case of one of them. The game was officially underway. Cooper was the first to guess. Twenty-five, he smugly proclaimed. Despite it being wrong, he had likely figured out that winning on his first turn might have been a bit too suspicious. The man checked his score and shook his head, all the while maintaining his calm smile. Higher, he replied. His voice was so weak and raspy that it sounded like he was constantly struggling for air. It was his turn to guess. Hmm, how about 70? Cooper made a clicking noise with his tongue, leaned back, and gave him the thumbs down. The whole game only lasted three rounds. 
Mr. Seg came dangerously close to hitting his mark on both his subsequent attempts, forcing Cooper to just pull the trigger and get it over with. 45. And just like that, it was over. I couldn't believe it. The plan actually worked. Cooper shot me a sly glance, his grin wider than ever, which I couldn't help but reciprocate. He extended his hand towards the dumbstruck man standing across from him, expecting his due reward. We were all taken aback as the man's sullen grimace suddenly turned to laughter. He cackled, wheezed, and then cackled some more. I'm not sure what sort of reaction we expected, but it certainly wasn't that. Before a now confused Cooper had the chance to retract his hand, Mr. Seg had grabbed it with both of his. He shook the boy's entire arm and then triumphantly slapped the coveted 50 note down in front of him. I had never seen the old man this lively before. He seemed genuinely overjoyed to have lost, as though a tremendous weight had been lifted off his shoulders. We looked on in stunned silence as he made his way over to the nearby intersection, laughing and cheering all the while. It was surreal watching him just stand there, tapping his feet against the pavement in celebratory fashion as the other pedestrians circled past him. He appeared to be waiting for something. Cars slowed down, thinking he intended on crossing but the scraggly old guy just waved them off with a smile. Think we broke him, boys? Cooper said in a self-satisfied tone, and then proceeded to wave his prize in each of our faces. I should have known better than to expect my contribution to be acknowledged. All of a sudden, Mr. Seg spun around theatrically. Our eyes locked. He smirked, gave a bow, and, to our absolute horror, jumped backwards in front of an oncoming truck. The driver had no time to react. The initial collision sent the ragged man tumbling down beneath the wheels, where his body was effortlessly crushed under the massive vehicle's weight. There was a crunch followed by a wet, squelching noise that caused me to look away. All around me... There were screams of panic and confusion. Ambulance! Somebody call an ambulance! A woman yelled. It was clearly much too late for that, though. The rest of the kids were quick to scatter. I felt Cooper grab me by the elbow and try to pull me back, but my body wouldn't move. It was like my soles were nailed to the ground. After a few attempts... He gave up and sprinted off as well. To this day, I'm not sure what compelled me to stay. Maybe it was shock, or perhaps it was a feeling of guilt. Whatever the case, step by timid step, I inched forth towards the scene of the crash. Childishly, a part of me still held out hope that it was going to turn out okay in the end. Such hopes were promptly dashed as soon as I squeezed through the crowd of concerned and morbidly curious adults that had gathered around the victim. Splattered against the tarmac was an unrecognizable pile of meat. The limbs that were still attached were bent in angles too painful to describe. There were bones protruding through the man's oversized sweater. I didn't even want to imagine what his body looked like underneath. His waist and stomach region were completely flattened, separating him in two. All that was left behind was a smear of entrails stretching up the road. His head was the only part of him that had somehow remained relatively intact. His face was turned towards the sky, expression eerie and void of emotion. Suddenly his lips began to move. Please... Let me go. Please let me go. He repeated, chanting it over and over like a mantra. The fact that he was still alive at all was a miracle. Although from the miserable Sod's perspective, it was clearly anything but. 
My stomach turned as the man's bulging, bloodshot eyes singled me out of the other bystanders. A warm trail of urine ran down my leg. His grimace twisted with anger. You! He hissed through broken teeth. You cheater! What have you done? She won't let me go. She'll never let me go because of you. The horrified crowd turned to look down at me. It was too much. I let out a scream and shoved past them, running away as fast as my short legs could carry me. I never told anybody about what happened that day. Not even my parents. It sort of remained this unspoken secret that everyone involved knew not to talk about. Ironically, the whole experience might have done the majority of us good since we'd quit playing caps and started attending classes again. Or, at least, that might have been the case if my story ended there. Years went by. I was a few days removed from my 17th birthday. It was Sunday, and I had the apartment to myself for once, which didn't happen very often. I was planning on spending the evening eating crisps and watching the most raunchy, rubbish TV show I could find when, suddenly, the phone rang. With nobody else around, I begrudgingly rolled off the sofa and sauntered over to pick it up. It was Cooper. It took me a minute to recognize his voice. We hadn't spoken in over three years, not for any particular reason. We just grew apart. Although he tried to maintain a friendly tone at first, it was clear that there was more brimming beneath the surface. It didn't take long for the desperation to leak through. His voice cracked, and I could practically hear him holding back tears. He started telling me how sorry he was, and that he had no other choice. I did my best to encourage him to be less vague, but it made no difference. He just kept on apologizing. I decided to just wait for him to calm down before trying to make sense of his babbling. Listen, he finally said. You're at your place, right? Go check if your door and windows are locked and call the cops. Tell them that somebody's trying to break in or something. Just trust me, please. I made an effort to extract more information, but my concerns remained unacknowledged. He kept insisting that I wouldn't believe him, and that telling me would only make me think that he was playing a prank on me. He asked if my folks were around. I said no. Oh no. Okay. Okay. Panic was starting to set in again. Okay, I'll call the cops for you. Just make sure everything's locked tight and find a place to hide. Or... You know what? Better yet, go over to your neighbor's. But do it fast. You don't want to be trapped outside when he gets there. Go. Now. And just like that, he hung up. I slowly placed the handset down, shutting off all the lights and walked up to the nearest window. It was pitch black outside. Droplets of rain trickled down the glass. Perhaps Cooper's insistence on remaining vague had been the right call since it made me take the threat away more seriously than I likely would have otherwise. I paced back and forth considering my options. I lived on the first floor, so, well unlikely, it was definitely possible for someone to break a window and climb in if they wanted to. I glanced down the cramped entrance hall. Our upstairs neighbors were a kindly older couple that would have invited me in without question, especially after explaining the situation to them. Screw it, I thought. I had watched enough horror movies to know what happens to that one skeptic guy who insists on ignoring all the warning signs until it's too late. I grabbed the keys off the table and headed for the door. Unfortunately... That was about as far as I got. Smarter men than me have debated just how far you can pervert the human form until it is no longer considered human. 
I'm not exactly qualified to determine where the line needs to be drawn, but there is one thing that I do know for certain. The thing standing on the other side of that threshold, bathed in the harsh light of the staircase corridor, was definitely not human. At least, not anymore. Its calcified hand shot forth and slapped against the insides of the door before I had the chance to slam it shut. I jolted back, blocking my only conventional means of escape was this misshapen husk of a figure. It was naked apart from the grimy overcoat draped over its frame, the front of which hung open to reveal shriveled, almost mummified looking flesh. Its body was held together by copper wire, and there were pieces of rebar connecting its upper torso to its pelvis. I had no idea how it still had use of its legs, considering that the metal bars were the only thing linking them to the rest of its skeleton. But as undeniably grotesque as the fusion of bone, gray flesh, and rusted metal was, it was its face that caused my chest to tighten. It wore a face that I instantly recognized despite its atrophied state. Mr. Seg? Is that you? The old man, or at least what was left of him, didn't say anything. Not at first. He only smiled, dry lips cracking as he did so. Just then did I notice that he was dragging some sort of tool behind. As his feet shuffled past the welcome mat, I saw it more clearly. He was wielding a crowbar. Your little friend told me where to find you. He told me everything. His voice was even weaker than I remembered, now barely above a whisper. He told me how the whole thing was your idea from the start. When I tried to protest, he struck the wall with his improvised weapon, chipping it and causing me to cower in fear. I considered screaming for help, but I had a feeling that he would have taken even less kindly to that. Sit, he demanded. I swallowed the lump in my throat, lowering myself onto the living room carpet. Mr. Seg nodded and gently closed the front door behind himself. We were drenched in darkness. The sole source of light was the TV which still droned on in the background. As terrifying as the man's appearance was, only being able to make out his crooked outline was arguably even worse. The walking cadaver stood by the entrance hall for a good while before finally shambling towards me. Each labored step sent chills running down my spine. My mind cycled through different and progressively bleaker scenarios. His joints made a disgusting pop as he knelt down directly in front of me. My nose burned, assaulted by the stench of mold and decay. One half of his ghastly face became illuminated by the bluish light emanating from the TV whereas the rest of him remained shrouded. He then reached into his pockets, producing bottle cap after bottle cap and placing them down between us. Is... is that what this is all about? Look, I'm sorry, we were just kids. We didn't know any better. The gaunt man shook his head. He cared little for my excuses. After having arranged all 20 caps, he pulled back and waited for me to shuffle them. It's not like I had much of a choice. The ultimatum was clear. Win, and presumably get to live. Lose or refuse to play and get your brains bashed in by an undead crowbar-wielding maniac. The rancid abomination sitting across from me, and I. Both selected our four caps and then discreetly confirmed our scores. My ears pulsated in tandem with the thumping in my chest. I had pulled a 10, a 20, and two 25s, meaning that my total score was 80. Round numbers are generally not considered ideal since they are easiest to guess. I was already off to a bad start. Mr. Seg took the liberty of going first. 
50. A predictable choice. Not too close, but not as far off as I would have liked. Now it was up to me to decide whether it was worth steering him away from the mark. A higher. I confessed after a few agonizing seconds of deliberation. He nodded. It was my turn. I didn't know where to start, so I just went with 50 as well. Lower, he murmured. To my knowledge, nobody had ever beaten him fair and square. I very much doubted that I was going to be the first. The goal was to survive long enough to come up with some sort of escape plan. 60, was his subsequent guess. Higher. I replied with even less confidence than before. I should have lied, but for some reason I was, once again, finding myself unable to. It was my turn again. 30. There wasn't a single feature of his that I could reliably read. It was like playing against a statue. Lower. If he was being truthful, then my only remaining choices were 20, which is the lowest possible score one can have, and 25, assuming, of course, that he hadn't been leading me astray from the start. 70. I was pushed against a corner. How was I expected to keep a straight face with the pale mask of death staring literally right at me? His next turn would have almost certainly been my last if I didn't think of a way to stall him. I could have pretended like he was wrong, but there was this lingering feeling in my gut that he would have known regardless if I was willing to admit it right, away, or not. Suddenly I recalled something. A detail that I've been clinging on to ever since what happened at that intersection. I doubted that bringing it up was going to make a difference, but it was worth a shot. Especially if it brought me some time. Who is... she? I saw him tense up despite the timidness of my inquiry. Noticing his reaction, I pressed the matter further. This time with a marginally more empathetic pitch to my tone. Back then, you said that she won't let you go. What does that mean? Mr. Segg looked down at the unfortunate state of his body. He ran a finger along the wires that bound its shriveled tissue together. There was a deep sense of regret and melancholy reflected in his sunken eyes. I was a boy, about the same age as you when we first met. I was... tired of always losing. He paused after every sentence as if expecting some malevolent force to strike him down. When nothing happened, he carried on. Always the loser, never the winner. He chuckled dryly, but then she came to me. He leaned in, cupping one side of his mouth while his clouded pupils darted warily about. His breath caused bile to rise to the back of my throat. I felt compelled to also check my surroundings, but saw nothing in the darkness that encompassed us. Then my eyes fell upon the crowbar that lay across his lap unattended. My palm began to itch. Lady Luck, he whispered. She offered me a deal and I took it. Now she won't let me go until... Knowing that I was unlikely to get another opening, I reached forth, snatched the steel bar, and dug its bent claw into the side of the corpse's neck. It was enough to knock him over. I crawled back until my shoulders hit a wall, and then slowly rose to my feet. There was no blood. It was like his skin was made of paper. Once the initial shock had subsided and I noticed him reaching for the tool embedded in his neck, I grabbed one of Mom's decorative pots from the counter and smashed it against his skull before running for the door. I stumbled down the single flight of stairs and, to my surprise and great relief, found two officers waiting for me at the bottom. All three of us heard the sound of glass shattering. When the cops went up to investigate, they only found a broken window. 
They search the alleyways and then the whole block, but predictably, discovered nobody matching my intruder's description. Of course, I spared them the more unbelievable parts of my account. They would have probably assumed that I was high if I told them that some Frankenstein's monster looking thing had broken into my home and forced me to play caps with him. I never heard from Cooper again. He was the one who rang the cops, so I can only presume that they had some questions for him as well. If they did, I was never informed of the outcome. He had moved several times since we lost contact, so I had no idea where to find him. For all I know, Mr. Seg could have gone back and finished the job. Though I doubt that. If he wanted to just straight up kill either of us, he would have done it. In fact, I don't think he was ever the real villain to begin with. He was but a symptom of something far more malevolent that's still out there, preying on the unsuspecting and gullible among us. It's been over two decades. I've been through a divorce, married again, and had two kids that are currently in their preteens. This is the first time I'm telling my story exactly how it happened. Why am I bringing it up now, you ask? It was my turn to drive the kids to school this morning. My daughter had forgotten her backpack, so I went up to her room to fetch it. When I picked it up off the floor, however, I felt something jiggle in one of the side pockets. The sound was all too familiar. I looked inside. What I found were exactly 20 bottle caps, each with a number written on the inside of it. I think we'll need to have a talk. I don't know who to turn to, so I made this account so I could post here. I sent emails dropped off notices at an apartment I helped manage because rent wasn't paid. Finally went there because no response. Found tenant's body slumped in a chair. It smelled really bad. Called the police, but while I was waiting for them to arrive, I noticed a notebook. Took a few pics of the pages. When I read it later, it freaked me out. Police won't answer my questions about how she died. I think the answer is in the pages. Please help. I am just freaking myself out. Or is there something of her ramblings? Thanks. Signed, R. December 5th, 2022. There are two crossed out lines. One says, account of the door. The other says, where is Susan? Why am I trying to title this? Who am I even writing this for? Whoever finds it? I guess, depending on what happens next. Well, okay. I better start at the beginning. I sometimes have memory problems. I'm not old. Only 37. But still, there's a world of difference between your 30s and your 20s. At 20, I could pull all-nighters and be up partying the next day. At 30, throwing my back out for the first time was the wake-up call that my body isn't what it used to be, and forgetting my keys, locked inside my car, was the wake-up call that my mind could use the occasional reminder to. That's what started the habit. My habit of leaving little notes. Little things like how it change a particularly complicated light in the ceiling. One of the fancy ones with a colored glass casing around it that has to be removed before you can reach the bulb. I went up there yesterday after the light went out to take care of the casing and just inside, written in black sharpie on a part of the glass, no one can see, except from a ladder, were instructions. My own handwriting telling me how to remove the casing and what kind of bulb I'd need. I have no memory of writing these instructions. But I thanked my past self, February 22nd, 2018. 
for the foresight. Susan laughed about this habit of mine. Last week, I was looking everywhere for the key to my desk drawer, and I caught her in the mirror rolling her eyes as she told me to look on the drawer underside. Sure enough, scribbled on the underside in Sharpie, it said, 8622. Check Pootie. Pootie is an old stuffed toy, and I always date my notes so I know how long ago I wrote them. The key was tucked inside Pootie's zippered back. Well, I'll be, I muttered as I slid open the desk drawer. I remember you commenting on where to put the key and you said, I'll put it in Pootie so I don't forget. And since you always forget, I insisted you write on the drawer. Oh, yeah. It was pretty embarrassing how right Susan was about my memory. Did you forget why you needed to open the drawer? No. I lied to myself as I half-heartedly shuffled through the jumbled papers, as if I were looking for something specific. I jammed the door closed and carefully returned the key to Pootie's zippered back. I promise all this is going somewhere. The point is, normally I don't think my forgetfulness is that big a deal, but when I went back to that drawer later on, thinking that if I organized it, I'd remember what I'd been looking for, I found a note I don't remember writing. Well, gee, you're probably thinking. I've already said I don't remember writing most of my little notes. Okay, fair enough. But when one of my notes says, Hey you, future me, if you can't find what you're looking for, check Pootie. With that, there's context and a clear purpose to why and when I wrote it. Millions of people every day spend time looking for their misplaced keys or their favorite coffee cup. We put stuff where we're sure to remember it and then instantly forget. Welcome to being human. But no, this note was different. No context to it. It came fluttering out of my desk drawer on hot pink sticky paper. November 13th. 2022. Call maintenance about that door. The note was folded in half. I unfolded it, and just underneath the fold and underlined twice. November 15th, 2022. No record of door. No record of door? What door? Which door did I have to call maintenance about that they had no records of? I asked Susan, but she just shrugged and said, could be any door. It's an old building. Stuff needs fixing all the time. Fair enough. But the note was dated only two weeks prior. Even for me, that was an unusual amount of forgetfulness. But what did I mean by no record? Later that same day, when I put on my comfy cardigan, I found another note crumpled up in the pocket along with chapstick and quarters for the laundry. I pulled out the rumpled note and read. November 16th, 2022. November 18th, 2022. November 21st, 2022. And on the back, boldly underlined, knocking. It was the knocking that got me really curious. So I went around checking all the doors. Bedroom, bathroom, closets, the creaky old door out to the little balcony overlooking the street. When I didn't find anything, I went in the hallway past dozens of neighbors' doors, all with the numbers in embossed gold flaking away above old keyholes. It's a building that has what I call character, and my family calls, please move out. Rattling radiators, stained carpeting, and my scribbling in the walls. I once read a NYT article about how after an old woman passed away, her son went to her apartment and found a decomposing body hidden in her freezer. She'd kept it there for more than 10 years. Honestly, this is just the kind of building that could happen in. Just recently there was an old man on floor 4 who got sick, and no one came in to look on him for weeks. Well, his body was decomposing just a couple of floors over our heads. 
anyway, finding no mysterious knocking, I return to my unit on the second floor. And then it struck me. What does absent-minded old me do to manage my own forgetfulness? I write stuff down. Duh. I went straight to my desk to check the first place I should have looked. My journal. I flipped back to November, the week before Thanksgiving. I found it. I found the door. I stared at inked sketch lines of concrete brick behind a vague outlined rectangle. On the bottom right corner was a scrawl like a scratched in face. A face? A yawning face. A screaming face? I don't know. I was still trying to discern whether it was really a face or just an accidental scribble when the journal was snatched out of my hands. Susan ripped the drawing out, shrieking at me. Can you just leave it? You left to forget all this, remember? Just forget about the door. She tore at the page savagely, frantically, ripping in a frenzy until there was nothing left but tiny rumpled bits. I sat there with my mouth hanging open, heart hammering, sunken into my chair as if I could disappear into it. Listening to my heart skip against my ribs like a frightened bird in a cage. What the? I whispered finally, reaching down to retrieve the notebook when she was gone. What? I don't usually swear, but I was worked up and want to record everything accurately. Anyway, after that outburst, I finally remembered what happened before the holiday. See, Susan's blow-up was probably about maintenance. It was already hard enough to get them out to the building, never mind the added barrier of what they considered my prank calls. Only my calls to them were never a prank. I called a few times right before Thanksgiving to report strange sounds behind the door in the basement. I might have called twice. Three times? The memory is all a little hazy because right before the holiday was so busy and stressful. My last call to building maintenance before I left for the holiday went something like this. Maintenance. You found a door in the basement, and someone was knocking? Me. That's right. Knocking. It was probably just pipes. No, no, it definitely wasn't pipes. It was knocking like someone wanting me to open the door. And this is going to sound crazy, but I thought I heard a person in there. It sounded like, like someone was crying. Okay, sure. No, 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 don't hang up. They stopped taking my calls after that, and I considered going down and opening the door myself with some sort of tool. But Susan told me, don't. What if you got it open only to get stuck inside? Then she told me that if I was really convinced a human being was inside, instead of bugging maintenance, I should call the police. She was really stressed that with all my calls, the next time we had a real emergency, maintenance wouldn't come out. It was a big deal for her. See, it was because maintenance had been unable to come out right away that she was the one who'd gone up to floor 4 to check on the old man a few weeks ago. And, well, it sort of traumatized me. Anyway, she was upset at the idea maintenance might essentially blacklist my unit, so she basically gave me an ultimatum. Either call the police, or forget the door stuff. I was about to leave for Thanksgiving with my family, so I could just use the trip as an opportunity to drop the matter. I considered. In all honesty, I had very little evidence there might be an actual person stuck behind this door. What would I show the police? My sketch of a basement door with a scary face that I drew? Then tell them I thought I heard noises down there? They'd chuckle condescendingly and say something like, Not to worry, Miss Marple. I'm sure whatever sounds you heard were just old pipes. And because I have no backbone, I'd just blush and awkwardly agree, and then we'd all be embarrassed for me. 
Long story short, I promised I'd drop the whole thing. And to be honest, being away from this creaky old building over the holiday, I really did forget completely about the door stuff. Until I found the sketch. It was the sketch that brought it all back. Weird though, isn't it? How thoroughly I forget it in such a short time. I remember perfectly now. I remember sitting in front of the door with my pen and scribbling the outline and the brick. But while I was away, it was almost like, somehow, leaving had smudged my memory. Almost like a half-forgotten nightmare. Anyway, after Susan's dramatic outburst, I was more curious than ever. I had to see this door. So I did the only thing I could do in order to know for sure. I went down to the basement. It sits tucked away in the corner at the end of a hallway. A narrow metal rectangle with rusty patches. The steely gray blending right in with the gray concrete of the walls. If I hadn't been specifically searching for it, I might never have seen it. That's how unobtrusive it was. And in the bottom corner, even more fuzzy and abstract than my drawing, were sketches and dents along the metal that, if you are an imaginative person, you could see as a screaming face. Given the dust on it, and the walls, and how it was almost invisible, I guessed it was an old storage closet. After a few minutes of exploring, but finding no way to open it, I knocked on the door. It was almost like knocking on solid brick. Nothing. Not even an echo. Tap. Right then, just as I was turning back to head up the stairwell, the soft sound of that tap stopped me. I looked back, frowning. Hello? I called. Silence. Must have been my imagination. I was about to walk away when I swear I heard a faint moan behind me. So soft I might have imagined it. And then the unmistakable sound of weeping. And though the sound was muffled by the door, I distinctly heard it say, If you open the door, you invite it in creepiest thing. It spoke in Susan's voice. December 6th, 2022. I haven't moved from this chair. I keep hoping for Susan. She's still missing. I keep hoping. If I just go about my business acting like everything is normal, if I go into work and put on a smile and go through the motions like everything's okay, maybe somehow it will be. Everything will go back to normal. Stop. Stop. Okay. I'm going to pick up where I left off. This won't make sense to whoever's reading unless I tell it in order. So, I was down in the basement. I heard what I thought sounded like Susan, but it couldn't have been her. Couldn't have been. I know because I was looking at the clock and it was after work started when I went down checking on the door. But I knew her voice. I wasn't sure how she could be in two places at once. I had chills all up my arms and along my spine. As I bolted the three flights back up to my unit, slammed the door, threw myself into my chair and slouched there, waiting all evening. Susan never came back from work. The next day? Was it Thursday? Friday? I call into work and asked after her. They told me she hadn't been to work in weeks. Not since before the holiday. So this morning I called maintenance again. And before they could hang up on me, I told them it was a real issue this time. That I'd found a pipe had burst. That there was water leaking all over the floor. From where? The maintenance guy asked, resisting the urge to say, from the door with the face. I described the general area in the basement and said I'd show him when he arrived. In fact, there really was water puddling around the basement floor, albeit because I spilled it there myself earlier. And after this, there will be a record of the door in the maintenance office. So... 
Anyway, I met the maintenance guy. Some new guy named Ryan. Not our usual cranky one. And I led him to where the puddle I'd spilled was. And he was like, what door? And like, the door was right there. He was looking right at it. And I traced my finger along the outline, and he kind of did this little blinking thing, and a shake and laugh, and said, Oh, that door. Then he scrunched his face and said, Didn't even know it was here. Then he mopped up the water and waited a few minutes, and said, I think there must have just been a spill. I'm not seeing any more water seeping out. Wait, you're not going to open it to make sure? I almost said. To make sure that no one's trapped in there, but caught myself and said instead, to make sure there's not still something leaking. He told me that he was just an assistant manager filling in, and that Manny, who usually works this building, was out until Thursday, and that Manny knows the ins and outs of this old place better than he did. He said he'd call a plumber if it was an actual emergency, and to let him know if I noticed more water. But for now, he'd make a note of it. Boom, boom, boom. The sudden banging made me jump. And he looked down at me funny and said, Oh, it's just the pipes. And when I asked if pipes are usually that loud, he shrugged and said, Sometimes. Made me wonder if we'd heard the same thing. I asked, Do pipes ever moan? Like, almost crying? He laughed, but it was obvious he was starting to suspect I was either a little off my rocker or pranking him, especially after I knocked on the door and said, Yoo-hoo, anybody in there? Susan, you playing a trick on us in there? My knuckles felt as if they'd wrapped against solid concrete. There wasn't even an echo. The management guy gave this kind of awkward chuckle and said, you definitely shouldn't be hearing any voices coming from there. Except maybe if you've eaten some funny mushrooms. He grinned at his own joke. As we headed back upstairs, he told me to call if I noticed another leak in that same spot, by the wall. December 8th, 2022. Time seems like it's just... slipping past. No one but me has noticed Susan's disappearance. No one has made the least bit of fuss about it. Her work called a couple of times last week, but they've obviously assumed she just quit. I tried calling them today again to ask about her, and they told me to stop making prank calls and hung up on me. Throwing out some old, wilted spinach made me think about the old man. I don't know how the spinach got so old so fast. I swear I bought it just yesterday. Or... Maybe the day before. I don't know. But it was slimy and had that rotting vegetable smell as if it was in the fridge forever. I should talk to Susan about doing some shopping. Really? I think I maybe scared her. Talking about the door. Obsessing over the knocking. It might have reminded her of what happened a couple months ago with the old man on floor four. It was Susan who found him. The old guy, I'd seen him once or twice on the stairs. Our building is from long before the ADA. No elevator. And I remember Susan worrying about him having to climb up and down so many flights all the time. She offered to help him with his groceries and things like that so he didn't have to make the trip up and down so much. I don't remember his name. Gary? Gregory? Anyway, so this old man hadn't been seen for a while, and I guess Susan worried whether he was doing alright or not. She went up to visit him and decided to go get him some groceries because his fridge was empty, and he was looking really thin, like he hadn't eaten properly in a while. He smelled bad and he was acting... dissociative, I think was the word she used. He kept saying strange things was obviously pretty muddled. He kept asking her, Where's Gregory? And she'd tell him, You're here. You're right here. And he'd just wring his hands and ask her where Gregory had gone. 
Creepy, right? I sure thought so. But Susan worried because he was so thin. She thought he hadn't been eating. She asked him if he needed help with groceries, and he said he hadn't had much appetite since Gregory left. So Susan got him a week's worth of groceries, made supper for him, and asked him for numbers of relatives or friends. Turned out he had none, so she called social services to come check on him. And then after that, things were more or less normal. That is, I assumed they were normal. Susan wanted to check in on him a few times, but I kept telling her to leave it alone. He was probably fine. To be honest, I was a little creeped out by the whole situation. I thought it was better to leave things to social services. But a few weeks later? Two? Three? I don't remember. Anyway, Susan was tired of me saying to leave things be. Just gonna check on him, she said. She went to his door, and what happened next was really strange. She heard knocking. She heard knocking from his door and heard him whisper, If you open the door, you invite it in. Gregory? She called. It sounded like he was crying, sobbing just on the other side of the door. She knocked. The crying continued, but the door did not open. She assumed he must be dissociating again, and she knocked and said, Gregory, let me in. And no one answered, but the door opened slightly. That was when she realized it wasn't locked. Gregory? She pushed the door open. The smell almost knocked her out. She later described it in her notes as putrid, rotting meat. This fetid, horrible, sour smell like old unwashed skin, and like meat you'd left in a container and forgotten about. It was the stench that made her realize something was horribly wrong. She called police and waited outside the door for them to arrive, but before they got there, she held her breath and poked her head in, just once. And she saw, there in the living room seated on a chair, a perfectly still figure slumped and motionless. She couldn't see anything of his eyes. His head was tilted back over the chair. Somehow she knew his mouth was open and his eyes were glassy. And that he was dead. Had been dead for days. That he died there in his living room sitting in that chair. Remnants of the supper she'd made for him two weeks earlier were still on the table. Police said he had starved to death, even while leaving the fresh groceries to rot on his counter. She kept thinking, if she'd checked on him sooner. Anyway. So now this door stuff. Knocking and Susan's voice. It has me terrified. Where has Susan gone? But whenever I try to tell anyone about it, they get annoyed and act like I'm pranking them. I don't know what to do. December 9th, 2022. I can see the outline of the door so clearly now. I'm not sure how I ever thought it hard to see before. It's never silent anymore either. Last time I was down there, I heard Susan and another voice. A quavering old man's voice. Both of them crying softly. As soon as I got near and whispered, Susan? A horrible racket started up. They were banging loudly, begging me to open the door, screaming. I saw something else I'd missed too. The door has a handle now. Let us out. Let us out. Please open it. I fled. December 10th, 2022. I called maintenance and got the actual maintenance guy, Manny. I tried to show him the door. Susan and Gregory, they were screaming the whole time. And he just looked at me like I was bonkers and told me, it's not a door, just a blank wall. I even tried to convince him to hook his fingers around the handle and pull, but he told me it was just a dirty crack in the mortar and he wasn't going to stick his fingers in. Then he said I needed help and left. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I 
came back to my room and, because the apartment is so filthy, it's usually Susan who keeps things organized and keeps me organized. I started cleaning out the desk drawer again, and I found another note. It was written on an old receipt, but it caught my notice because I didn't recognize the handwriting at all. It was a spidery, shaky script, as if the pen was held by someone with very unsteady hands. It read, If you open the door, you invite it in. I turned over the receipts to see when this note had been written, and got a chill because the receipt was from months ago. And it was Susan's. It was Gregory's. Did Susan... Did she invite something in? When she found that old man dead? December 14th, 2022. I went down and mudded and painted over the door today. I ignored the screams. It's in my head, right? No one else can see the door, so it must be in my head. So I just mudded over the door and the screams and then waited for it to dry and then painted it all the same flat gray. I also mudded over the handle so there's no possible way to open it anymore. Only once I painted over it and got back upstairs into my own apartment did I realize how bone weary I was and filthy. I called Manny again. He's sick to death of me. I'm surprised he picked up. He actually sounded less cranky with me this time, more just concerned. I told him I painted over the door, that I mudded over everything. I just needed to talk to someone. Sorry, I hope it doesn't cause much trouble. I just didn't want to see it anymore. It's... the paint wasn't a perfect match, but the color is pretty close. I hope that's okay. Okay, Susan, he said. Okay, thank you for telling me. I frowned. Susan's not here. I think she's... Behind the door? I know. Okay, look. Don't worry about the paint. I'm off work soon. I'll come over and take a look and make sure it's all mudded over properly and everything. You just promise me you won't go down to the basement again, okay? There's no reason for you to be down there felt myself bristling, because he was talking to me as if I were some sort of child, as if I'd gone senile. I glowered into the phone, but relaxed a bit as he said that he was going to be at my apartment that evening just to check up on things in my unit. It made me feel strangely better, even though I knew he was still thinking of me as some crazy lady who should be sleeping in a padded room. I thanked him and hung up. Looked around my place. It was a mess. Without Susan to clean, the pile of dishes had been sitting in the sink growing fuzz for... Honestly, I don't remember the last time I had a meal. At some point I'd filled water around the dishes, but it was fetid. New forms of life evolving from the primordial soup. Pretty gross. Not to mention I hadn't showered in, well... My clothes still had paint on them and felt as if they had crusted to me. And since I didn't want Manny to think I was both crazy and filthy, I figured I'd best make an effort to at least correct one of those things. I hauled myself out of my chair and changed my clothes. Then went into the kitchen, shuffling toward the looming dishes with a leery eye. I was in the middle of draining and refilling the sink with soapy water when Manny arrived. Boom, boom, boom. Coming, I called. Turning off the water and shuffling to the door, opening it with, Thanks so much for coming. The words died in my throat. There was no one outside. I stepped back, panicked. I realized that I was standing in the basement, that at the bottom of the door was a face. The face I'd sketched in my drawing. Screaming, I recognized it now. It was my face. Screaming from the bottom of the door I'd just opened. I don't know the date. I don't know where I am. It's dark. There's nothing here. No food or water. 
The notebook is still in my lap, but I... It takes so much energy to write. I think this will be my last entry. I can't leave. The door won't open. I try banging, but no one hears me screaming. More and more, I'm starting to suspect I am actually in the basement. I'm in the door, the one I mudded and painted over, and maybe that's why no one can hear me. I know it sounds crazy, but I think when I opened the door, I somehow entered the basement. Is Manny still coming? I don't think he'll find me in the basement. I've been pounding the door. No one answers. It took Gregory. It took Susan. It took Susan. It took Susan. Okay, so never done one of these before, so bear with me. My thoughts are kind of scattered. This happened a few months ago, though, so I've had some time to figure out how to explain this. But let me give some background. Me and my friend group from high school go on a trip every summer to some place. One year we got a lake house for a week, the next a penthouse in the city, but this year we got a beach house in North Carolina. I changed the names, but there's me, Griffin, DJ, and then there's Kylie, Maddie, and Claire. We all sort of went our own ways in college, grew up a bit, and changed. This trip every summer always brought us back together. So this was our third trip, and we just finished our junior year of college. We got to the house, and it was sick. We practically had our own beach because the closest houses were like half a mile on either side. It was a super awesome spot and we were all excited that we didn't have to worry about noise complaints or anything. We promptly got changed and made our way to the beach. Griffin and Maddie hung back to make us frozen drinks. We're pretty sure they're hooking up. Not important. I just wanted to add it because Griffin sometimes reads this kind of stuff. But yeah, they hung back, and when they came down to the beach, we got plastered. Looking back, putting the frat boy and party girl in charge of making us drinks wasn't a good call, but... Dang, were those drinks strong. So we all got super drunk and had a pretty solid day at the beach. About an hour or two into chilling, DJ goes. Wanna grab the spike ball? Why? You want me to give you the smoke? Griffin said this, then spilled his drink while laughing at his own joke. Ah, oh, shit, it's on my pants. Then he ran in the ocean. DJ and I went back to the house to grab the lacrosse sticks he brought, and the spike ball net. We got to the house and grabbed the sticks and stuff from the car. That's when we heard the most blood-curdling scream we've ever heard. I know it's cliche, but I genuinely felt the hairs on my arms stand up straight. DJ and I looked at each other, and he started in a full-on sprint to the beach. I guess he assumed it was one of the girls and wanted to see what happened in case something went down. I followed. Once we got over the dunes, we saw Griffin running to us. DJ asked, Bro, what happened? What do you mean? That wasn't you guys? Griffin asked, confused. No, we thought it was you guys. We all just sort of stood there and scanned the area. After walking around the perimeter for a bit, we went back to the beach and tried to play it off, but we made sure to keep an eye out for whatever made that noise. We ended up chalking it up to being a fox or something. DJ was a hunter, and said it was plausible, so that's all the explanation we needed, and we got right back to drinking and messing around. It did kind of kill the vibe though, so we packed up after 30 or so minutes, and went back to the house. We all went to our respective beds, slash couch for post-beach and drinking naps. We woke up an hour or two later, and continued our day. Honestly, the rest of the night was pretty normal. We just sort of hung out, played some drinking games, and hung out. But when we woke up the next morning, we realized we wouldn't be able to have another beach day, as it was torrential downpouring outside. 
All that really meant was that drinking and smoking would be taking place inside today. We were pretty much split half and half. Me, Griffin, and Maddie were drinking while DJ, Claire, and Kylie were getting high. As the day went on, the rain got worse, and we got more messed up, which is why when Claire and Kylie said they heard something outside, we figured it was just them being paranoid and freaked out from the storm. But after they insisted on it not being the weed or rain, we set our designated tough guys, Griffin and DJ, to check it out. After about 10 or so minutes, they came back soaking wet and out of breath. We asked them if they saw anything, and then they explained that they were just doing a lap around the house and talking shit when they saw something moving by the dunes. They called out, but whatever it was just went deeper into the dunes. So they head over, but when they got there, they couldn't find whatever it was. So after looking for a bit, they gave up and came back. This sort of creeped us out, but they assured us it was fine, and it was probably just an animal or the wind or something. Everyone else relaxed a bit, but I was more skeptical. After eight plus years of friendship, you pick up on subtle speech patterns and stuff like that. And I could tell when DJ said this, he was trying to make us calm down. I pulled DJ aside and asked him about it alone. But all he said was, Listen man, I don't know what it was, but we're all good. Odds are it was just a deer and Griffin just had one too many. I honestly agreed. Griffin, well I love him, is not the most reliable source. Especially while drunk. As the day went on, we just hung out and tried to wait out the rain, which didn't work because it went on until it was dark out. We ended up playing a drinking game in the living room. It was something called spoons, but that's not important. What is important is that after playing for a bit, we heard what we thought were people outside. It sounded like they were playing music and talking and all that. It was like they were having a party. We all looked at each other confused. Kylie went. I thought there was, like, no one else around. There isn't. I answered. Who's out there? Griffin and DJ stood up. DJ grabbed a lacrosse stick, and Griffin grabbed a flashlight. I was going to let them handle it, but after the girls looked at me, as I just sat there, I felt guilty, so I got up too. All I had was a pocket knife I always kept on me. I guess my role was moral support, as if there were people outside and we had a confrontation. DJ and Griffin would be our main assets. I just sort of followed them as they walked around the house. Like an idiot in a horror movie, Griffin shouted, Who's out there? And then shined his flashlight across the dunes. This time I saw it. We couldn't make out what it was, but it looked like something was moving. DJ and Griffin looked at each other and take off towards it. I was hesitant, but I followed as well. But when we got to the dunes, there was nothing. No people. No footprints. Nothing. Nothing on the beach. No sign of anything being there. We looked around for a bit, but couldn't find anything. So we went back to the house and locked the doors, and turned on all the outside lights. We slowed down on the drinking and all just sort of sat there. The girls kept asking what was out there, but just had to explain there was nothing, which they found annoying. What was weird is how this affected the vibe. We never had any problems, hardly had any fights in our group, but now everyone was on edge. Kylie and Maddie, who have been best friends since they were six, weren't talking. Claire, who is our resident chill stoner, was paranoid as heck. So I figured the girls were just freaked out, but when Griffin was acting off too, I knew something was wrong. Griffin was one of the nicest guys I've ever met. Always cracking jokes, always smiling. He was stone cold. Looking out the window, at nothing. Fists balled like he was ready to fight. DJ, on the other hand, was drinking. Way more than usual. I was also distant, just not involved in what was happening. 
like everything was in a fog and I couldn't connect to the conversation. I figured it was best for me to bring this up. I'm not usually one to speak up about stuff, but I just had to say something. Guys, we gotta stop. There's nothing out there. Let's just relax, okay? Have some fun? They all just looked at me, and like that, they snapped out of it. Like nothing had even happened. It's like they came out of a trance or something, and then bam, we were having fun again. We quickly got back into the swing of things and kept drinking. But there was still some tension between everyone. I decided to throw on some music to hopefully alleviate the awkwardness. This actually did help a bit. The mood was a bit better. Griffin started cracking jokes again. The girls were talking again. It was going pretty well. Sadly, because of how well things were going, we didn't realize that DJ had left. He just up and walked out. We were lost in our conversations until we were all cut off by another blood-curdling scream. We all went silent. We were frozen. Something was different about this scream. It was closer. That's when Claire broke the silence. Wait, where is DJ? We all looked around the room. Nothing. We ran through the house. Nothing. Then all of a sudden, Griffin went into superhero mode. He grabbed one of the lacrosse sticks left on the table and practically ran through the door. He didn't seem to care about the potential danger. I, on the other hand, was more scared of what could be out there. But I couldn't just let Griffin go out there by himself, so I grabbed a flashlight and followed. We ran for only 30 or so seconds, yelling out for DJ. We didn't get a response. Only thing out there was the beach and the ocean. We made it to the beach, but were stopped in our tracks by a low, deafening sound. The closest thing I could relate to it would be like a tugboat horn. It felt like how it feels when you hear fireworks and get that hit to your chest. It lasted only 10 or so seconds, but those 10 seconds blew. I shined my flashlight out into the ocean, but we didn't see anything besides a buoy floating 50 or so yards out. I looked at Griffin. He was mad. Stick close to me. Then he breaks off in a jog down the beach. He's scanning back and forth looking for any sign of DJ. We made it to another set of dunes, then he stopped. I stopped too and looked at him. He went from pissed to terrified. Turn off the light. I'm obviously pretty confused, but then I follow his gaze and see it. I don't really know how to describe it. It was like a giant moving mound of sand or something. It was shaped like someone made a sculpture of a human out of sand. I honestly don't know. It had two arms, two legs, had a head-like thing, but it was more of a dome that sat on top. And it was covered with scattered rocks and seaweed. I fell back in fear. I genuinely couldn't move. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't. The flashlight got buried in the sand, and that just made it harder to make out what this thing was. I don't think I really understood how big this thing was. I was just mesmerized by it. And more accurately, terrified. Then I realized it was getting closer to us. Griffin stood there motionless. He followed it with his eyes, but he too was frozen. While it was getting closer, it wasn't walking towards us. It was walking past us with no purpose or urgency. Like it was just going for a stroll on the beach. It walked sluggishly, like it was dragging its legs in the sand. It wasn't until it was right next to us, I mean like 15 or so feet away from us, that I realized how big it was. Griffin is just over 6 feet tall and is pretty built. He looked like a child next to this thing. It had to be almost double his height and twice as wide. It dwarfed him. Then it looked at us. I could tell because it turned its head towards us where I saw two divots in the sand. I'm guessing those were its eyes. That was when a mouth formed. 
It opened up like a puppet, and out came a muffled and echoed, Why? You want me to give you the smoke? Oh shit, it's on my pants. It was Griffin's voice. I looked up at Griffin and saw that tears began to roll down his face, but he still couldn't move. What? These words were broken up by Griffin trying not to burst out in a sobbing, crying fight. The thing kept walking past us. Then another voice came out of it. It was DJ. Calm down, man. You're good. Just relax. You're fine. Just breathe. This must have provoked Griffin enough that he could muster up all the courage to speak. Quietly, I heard him ask, Where... where is he? The sand thing turned and looked at us. It then lifted one of its arms in the direction it came from as if it was pointing. Then it continued walking. We didn't move. It just kept playing these sounds. There were seagulls, waves crashing, rain, anything you could think of that you might hear on the beach it had copied and was just repeating. I also noticed that despite it dragging its feet in the sand, it didn't leave a trail. The only thing it left behind was the occasional piece of seaweed or rock that fell off its body. We watched it go to the dune, grab a handful of grass and shove it in its mouth, then keep walking. Eventually, after it was over a hundred or so feet away, I slowly got up and approached Griffin. He was still messed up, but snapped out of it when I said, We've got to go find DJ. We wandered down the beach, and eventually, after looking for ten minutes, we found him unconscious in the sand. He didn't seem to be hurt, no bruises or anything like that. So me and Griffin picked him up and carried him back to the house. We were pretty cautious not to run into that thing again, despite it not actually doing anything to us. We didn't want to risk it. We made it back to the house and put DJ down on the couch. Then we had to explain what just happened to the girls. I honestly wasn't sure where to start, and Griffin didn't even really want to talk about it. But we really didn't have to because DJ woke up. And the first thing he said was, Was that real? Me and Griffin instantly knew what he was talking about. Griffin spoke up, but only said, Yeah. I had to ask, Did it hurt you? DJ was shaken and trying to collect his thoughts. Can't blame him. He went, No. I went for a walk to try and calm down. Then that thing showed up and, like, waved at me. What thing? Claire was getting annoyed. We didn't care and kept listening to DJ. Then it offered me a bunch of seaweed. That's pretty much all I remember. What are you guys talking about? Kylie was also getting annoyed. Then we started to explain the whole situation. They didn't believe us. To be fair, it is a lot to hear and pretty hard to believe, but we were getting pissed off that they didn't believe it. Then, almost on cue, we heard us. Like from outside, that thing started playing me and Griffin calling out, DJ, DJ, dude, where are you? The girls went over to the window. We locked the doors. As if locking the door would stop that thing if it wanted to get in here. They said they didn't see anything, but pulled the blinds down. We left the next morning. We honestly didn't really talk about it much. The car ride home was pretty quiet. We only talked about this a handful of times. Once was when we all got together over Thanksgiving break. This was when DJ told us why he really went out for his walk that night. He said he needed to find out what was in the dunes, and that it just didn't make sense. So he dipped when no one was looking because he didn't want to sound weird. Then he said he started getting paranoid and had a panic attack. The other time was actually last night. I was on Xbox with Griffin and around 1am just started spilling about how he hasn't really stopped thinking about it. And now he wants to go back. I also want to go back. That thing wasn't malicious. It almost seemed helpful from what we saw, and what DJ said. If we go back, I'll update you guys, but yeah, 
I just wanted to tell someone about it, because right now, it's pretty much just our group that knows. So yeah, thanks, I guess. Oh, and by the way, DJ had a good name for this thing. He called it the Sand Walker. Okay, so I guess, hey again. If you read my last post, you understand that stuff sort of went down over the summer. If you haven't read my last post, well, I guess the best way to explain it is that stuff sort of went down over the summer. I'll link it here. Honestly, you'll be pretty lost, so I kind of recommend reading it. Long story short, saw a giant thing on the beach. It made some weird sounds, and we left. What I'm writing right now is picking up just about two weeks ago. After about a few days of me and Griffin texting DJ trying to convince him to come with us back to North Carolina, somehow we eventually got through to him. Which, I'll be honest, I wasn't expecting. Like, at all. Out of all of us, he seemed to be the most freaked out by the whole situation. To be fair, we were all pretty shaken up. I didn't really hide my emotions too well, but compared to DJ, I was doing just fine. Pretty much every time we brought up the whole situation, he would just sort of shut down. It really messed with him. But I guess he was also the one who was most intrigued by it. Despite how we all felt about the situation, and how terrified we may have been, it was unanimous that we had to go back to confirm what we saw. The whole trip was pretty short notice. By December 7th, we had decided to go, and by the 9th, we had the house booked. We were even able to get the same house as last time. I mean, it wasn't like we were fighting with other renters to get a hold of it. Not too many people are trying to rent a beach house in mid-December. Not to mention, since it was the off-season, the price was lower, which meant we were able to afford to just go with the three of us. We all decided to leave the girls behind because, one, we didn't want them to get freaked out any more than they already were, and two, they never even saw the Sandwalker, so in reality, they didn't really have much to do with it. Not to mention it was unanimously agreed upon that none of us wanted to get the girls involved just in case anything happened. My dad dropped me off at Griffin's house the morning of the 14th. I got there around the same time as DJ, and after Griffin's parents made us some breakfast, we were on the road. Griffin pretty much always had a smirk on his face and practically dripped confidence. The smirk was there. The confidence was not. It was almost like he was putting on a facade to hide something. I can only assume that something he was hiding was fear. DJ had a different method of dealing with his anxiety. His eyes were locked on the road and he remained quiet for the majority of the drive. I wanted to chalk this up to him being focused on the road, but I knew he was mentally preparing himself for the days to come. I tried to break the silence by playing some music. At most, this helped drown out the awkwardness that had engulfed the car. After the two hour mark, it seemed we had settled in and DJ finally started talking. So, how's school been? It wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. Luckily, this was all that was needed to get Griffin on a tangent about one of his funny, yet somehow bizarre, college stories. This kickstarted what was a relatively normal car ride. Eventually, we pulled into the driveway of the house and began to unload the car. It wasn't until this moment that I realized just how much each of us was affected by our encounter this last summer and how each of us had approached this trip in our own unique ways. DJ had unloaded his three bags, his backpack, his suitcase, and then a duffel bag filled with guns. Unlike last time where DJ had packed a spike ball net and lacrosse sticks, he must have decided that if anything were to happen this time, he would be prepared. I shifted my gaze to the left and watched Griffin swing a case of water over one shoulder, and his two bags over his other. It was here that I realized his idea of prepping for this trip was to put on as much muscle as possible. Just in the few weeks since Thanksgiving, he had grown significantly larger. 
I, on the other hand, had spent my time researching different mythology, zoology, and cryptozoology. It seemed we had all played to our strengths to get ready for our return to the beach. DJ with his history of hunting, Griffin with his physicality, and me with my... I don't know. Being a nerd, I guess. You get the point. We all grabbed our stuff from the car and then just sort of stood there. All of us looked out towards the beach. All of us, presumably, replaying the events of our summer vacation. The atmosphere was almost identical to the last day of our previous trip. Cloudy, looked like it was about to rain, and nothing but the sound of waves crashing and seagulls chirping. The sound of the beach ambience was broken when DJ said, Come on, let's go. And then made his way inside. I went with shortly after, and then after a few more moments of waiting, Griffin followed as well. We unpacked our things and after settling in, we went out trying to get some information from the locals. Unfortunately, we didn't seem to think that almost all of the houses would be empty on account of the majority of them being summer homes. After a little over an hour of going door to door looking for someone, the sun began to set and we settled on going back to the house before we lost daylight entirely. By the time we got back to the house, it was about four in the afternoon. After getting back to the house, it was decided that we would go to this diner slash barbecue place we passed on the way there for dinner. Since we didn't have any luck talking to locals in the surrounding houses, we figured this would give us a chance to maybe get some more information. We also used this as an excuse to delay the inevitable of going back onto the beach. Griffin drove us there, and after getting seated we realized just how dead this town really was during the off-season. There were only eight people in the whole restaurant, three of which were us. We ordered, and had all decided that it would be best if we wait to ask about the thing we saw over the summer until after getting our food. Sadly, the waitress wanted nothing to do with our questions. I guess she disliked the topic so much it prompted her to bring out the busboy to make sure after finishing our food and paying we got out immediately. So we ate our food, left the cash on the table, and were escorted out. Before practically throwing us from the barbecue joint, the busboy, who was more of a bus man, standing about a foot over myself, said a bit of information that actually was of some value. Listen, I know what you boys are talking about. Just drop it. It ain't worth the trouble you're gonna get in. I don't think those were his exact words, but this is close enough. The weird thing is, he didn't say this as a threat. He said it as advice. Like he was looking out for us. Like this has happened before. After returning to the house, we contemplated what to do. It was eventually decided that we would ignore the man's advice and continue on with what we came to do. We rested for only about an hour, then as we all sat there in the living room, I watched as the clock went from 8.59 to 9. It was officially as dark as it was going to get, with only the moon lighting up the beach. I looked up at Griffin and DJ. They were just sitting there staring at the guns on the table. I guess I had to be the one to initiate stuff now. So, against better judgment, I mustered up a... You guys ready? They both lifted their heads to look at me. Griffin had a forced smile on his face. DJ was deadpan. Ready to go. There were three guns on the table. One shotgun, one rifle, and one handgun. I would go into the specifics, but that is genuinely all I know. DJ had given me and Griffin a quick rundown to how to shoot guns in an open field we passed on the drive down to the house. Plus, he had taken us shooting back in high school when we stole one of his dad's hunting rifles. DJ didn't want us going into this without knowing how to use our guns, so this little bit of shooting practice we underwent was the best we could do for the time being. DJ took the rifle because he was the best shot out of the three of us. Griffin took the handgun, and I took the shotgun. 
Griffin also insisted on bringing a baseball bat there he kept in his backpack as he wasn't a huge fan of guns. Honestly, I'm not sure of what he planned to do with this, but whatever made him feel better, I guess. It had been discussed previously that we weren't here to hunt the Sandwalker, but just observe and if we're lucky get a picture. But the guns were our contingency plan. Along with the guns, we each had flashlights on us, and Griffin even had his GoPro strapped to his chest. We all looked at each other and knew it was time to go out there. The cold air flooded into the house as we opened the door to the porch and looked out onto the beach. This gave nothing but the sound of waves crashing and wind blowing. The only thing was we couldn't even tell if it was authentic or if it was being replayed by that thing. And I won't bore you with the details because there are none. We were on that beach from 9 until midnight and there was nothing. No monster. No weird sounds absolutely nothing out of the ordinary. This, for lack of a better term, made us mad. It made us feel crazy. It made us question what we had all seen. We decided we'd go back to the house and try again the next night. We didn't get that chance though, because on the way back as we walked through the sand, we heard the roaring of engines. Initially, we all thought it was the sand walker until we saw the lights emitting from headlights fastly approaching. We all assumed that these were cops, which prompted DJ to dig his gun license out of his pocket, and also had us begin to hide the other two guns in Griffin's backpack. As the lights approached, we realized these weren't cops. They were just regular people, all brandishing guns. We fished the guns out of the bag and stood there waiting. The three ATVs were followed by a dune buggy. In total, I counted seven men, all of which were armed. They got within 15 or so feet of us when they let up on the throttles and the engines died down. There were a few seconds of a stare down between us and the men. Within these seconds, there was nothing but silence. This silence was cut off by a familiar voice saying, Oh, these guys again? I turned my gaze to face the voice and noticed that the man who was talking was the same busboy from earlier. These are the city boys I was talking about. We're not from the city. Griffin was interrupted by one of the men. Despite this being a beach town with a population that was made up of relatively normal suburban people, these men were different. These men were rugged, more calloused. You could tell just from looking at them. They weren't just regular people who lived in a beach town. The best way I could describe it is that they were more outdoorsy than the rest of us. What the hell are you boys doing out here? One of the men said this as he held his gun. He didn't hold it towards us, but he was ready to fire at a moment's notice. Don't tell me you're trying to hunt that thing. The busboy spoke up once again, with a few guns and a baseball bat. I decided since it was originally my plan to come back that I should be the one to speak up. We're not trying to hunt it. We just wanted to know what we saw. The following ten or so minutes were filled with us arguing back and forth, mainly consisting of us three leaving for our own safety. Throughout these arguments, we luckily were able to gain some semi-valuable information. This was more than we expected to get when we traveled house to house looking for locals to interview. There were three main things we gained from this conversation. The first was that every year, this thing procreates and that their litters can consist of anywhere between 10 to 20 pups. The second thing we learned was that the older these things get, the more docile and tranquil they become, only coming out every few nights when no one is around, eating whatever plants are readily available. The third thing we learned was more disturbing. The Sandwalker, well docile in its older age, is incredibly hostile and aggressive in its younger years. While its more mature counterpart is herbivorous, the diet in their earlier years consists of anything they can get their hands on, 
including animals, and in the rare case, people. This is where the hunters we had run into come into play. They were equipped with enough guns and bullets to take out a small army, and it became abundantly clear to us it was because they planned on taking out an entire litter of sandwalkers. They said they did this to protect their own. Apparently, if these things ever got out and began to wreak havoc, as one of the men put it, the tourism in their town would plummet and the lives of a lot of people would be ruined. So every year, they would take out the freshest batch of sandwalkers. The three of us stood there, confused and processing what we had just learned. We tried to digest the information, but it was too much. You had an encounter with the big one, one of the bigger guys asked. We assumed that he was their leader because of how he positioned himself in the front of the group, and how his voice carried a sort of authority with each word he said. DJ spoke up. Yeah, just sort of... His voice trailed off and he grew silent. Griffin then took over as he realized DJ was shutting down once again like he always did when the subject was brought up. It's a long story, but with you guys hunting, the cops ever get calls about gunfire and stuff? The leader just sort of chuckled. Well, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Blake. People call me Chief because, well, I'm the Chief. He pulled out his badge and flashed it to us. I don't know much about the police badges, but I'm pretty sure you can't just acquire one, so this dude was legit. You boys ever shoot before? DJ snapped out of it. Been hunting since I was ten. You too? The chief asked. I'm still unsure of why, but Griffin lied to the man and told him we had a decent amount of experience with guns. Despite this... The chief instructed one of the men to get us off the beach and back to the streets to make sure we were all good. The busboy hopped from his ATV and offered to take us back, but before we could even get a few feet from the group we were distracted by a sound. It sounded like a boat blowing its horn. We all directed our attention to the ocean, but even with our flashlights, all eleven of us were shining them across the horizon but none of us saw anything. There was an eerie familiarity of this exact feeling, the feeling of looking out to find the sound of a boat, but being met with nothing. This instantly sent a chill down my spine. Then suddenly, the sound grew. It no longer was just one horn, but like a symphony of trumpets. It seemed almost as if a bunch of car horns were going off at once, like rush hour traffic. Then I remembered the sound we had heard a few months before. It was the tugboat horn. I froze. I was absolutely paralyzed and stuck staring at Griffin and DJ. They too were frozen with fear. The mental prepping, the gun collecting, the muscle building, the monster research. Everything we had all done to get ready for this trip seemed futile. As we were all overtaken with fear. I was eventually able to turn myself around, and I then saw the chief yelling, but I wasn't fully able to make out the words. It was obvious that the other men were able to hear his orders as four of them promptly lit their flares they had pulled from their bags, and threw them into various spots of the beach. This provided enough light for us to see fifteen or so miniature sand walkers closing in on us. I say miniature, but these things ranged anywhere between three to seven feet tall. They were slightly faster than the one we encountered over the summer, but still relatively slow. While we stood there staring at them, the chief scrambled to us and rushed us into the dune buggy. He pulled my ear to his mouth and yelled, Stay up there and get ready. Then, all hell broke loose. Each one of them opened fire. The flares resting in the sand grew obsolete because of how much the muzzle fire lit up the beach. The sound of the tugboat horn switched from a low rumble to a more screeching cry. Originally, I mistook this as a cry of pain, but I quickly realized that it was actually a battle cry of sorts. 
DJ hopped off the buggy and began to do what he could in order to help. Me and Griffin, on the other hand, were still in total shock. I guess DJ's experience with hunting had prepared him for this kind of stuff because he had some sort of instinct neither Griffin nor I possessed. I still could barely move. My hands shook with fear and my palms were cold with sweat. I turned my head to Griffin whose mouth was hung open and eyes wide with awe. My gaze then shifted to DJ whose face displayed a different kind of expression. His eyes narrowed and his teeth were gritted. He had taken his fear and turned it to rage. I tried to keep count on how many bullets it took to take just a single one of them down. The most I counted was around 50. The least I counted was around 20. There was the rare occasion where one of the pups got too close to one of the men, and they would all shift their fire to focus the approaching threat. Their synchronized fire and organized demeanor made it obvious that they had done this many times previous to tonight. After ten minutes of non-stop gunfire, it finally began to die down. Once muzzle fire stopped, the beach became illuminated by the low red glow produced by the flares that had now become slightly suppressed by sand that had been kicked up from stray bullets. With a call from the chief, Four of the men then began gathering the bodies and dragging them to form a pile. They did this while the busboy doused them in gasoline. The chief then walked up to us and said something to the effect of, Sorry about that. Didn't expect them to come out so early. Guess we got them excited. He laughed as he said this and then lit a cigarette. Then he made some joke about how we had probably never hunted anything like that before. Honestly, I don't know what exactly happened because of how my eardrums were filled with what I can only describe as the roar of war. It was the gunfire, the screaming, the sound of the battle that had just been fought. The strangest part about all this sound was that it somehow managed to be even louder than before. Despite us all being in the center of it, the sound was so powerful that it genuinely forced me to the ground. As I sat in the sand with my back pressed against the buggy, I plugged my ears. Even then, I was unable to escape the sound of gunfire. I looked up and realized even the chief was stunned. He winced as he covered his ears. We all turned our gaze to the direction of the sound. That's when we saw it. The silhouette of the sand walker. This was the supposedly docile and peaceful mature version who at that moment was charging us. While I still wouldn't consider its pace fast by any means, it was significantly faster than what I had witnessed over the summer. We could barely make it out, but it couldn't be anything else. There was a gap in the roar of mimicked gunfire, and in that moment I could hear the chief mutter the words, What the hell? The cigarette that hung from his mouth dropped to the sand which promptly ignited the trail of gasoline that had unknowingly been building as the busboy too was frozen with fear. Within seconds the pile of corpses erupted into flames. The stench filled our noses and the flames illuminated the beach. With these growing flames we could finally clearly see this goliath charging us. It was maybe 20 yards away, but it was gaining speed. Guns were drawn and two men quickly opened fire once again. But unlike the pups, this one didn't go down as quickly. The seven hunters, eight including DJ, were blasting bullets into this thing, one after another. There wasn't a second where it wasn't being pierced with someone's shot. Despite this, it didn't stop. It hardly even slowed down. Stray fragments of sand and rock sprayed from the sand walker, with each bullet hit. But it seemed to just be filled in with some sort of the excess it carried upon its body. I was in such a panic from the gunfire that I hadn't realized where exactly the sand walker was running to. Its path was lined up with the ignited pile of sand walkers. 
in front of which was DJ, who stood firing his rifle from atop the ATV. Griffin must have caught on to this because suddenly, he drew his gun from his holster and began rushing to DJ. As he ran, he frantically fired into the approaching beast. I quickly realized that the few bullets from Griffin wouldn't be nearly enough to do any harm. I too tried to run, but my feet wouldn't move. I was still paralyzed with fear and the roar of gunfire was still being matched with the cry of the monster. It didn't matter that I couldn't move though because once I finally got myself to move, the sandwalker finally reached them. Griffin stood there clicking his gun that had already run out of ammo. Griffin reached back and in a single motion pulled his bat and swung as hard as he could into the monster. It didn't even flinch. It hardly acknowledged him. Griffin drew back once again and his face donned a furious expression of rage. I watched as the Sandwalker haphazardly swung its arm into Griffin, which flung him through the air. He flew 30 or so feet where he landed somewhere in the dunes. Griffin's attempt, while futile, gave DJ enough time to fire his final two shots into its head. Those two well-placed shots did stun the beast, but within seconds, DJ too was launched by a single blow from the Sandwalker's arm. Watching my friends, both of which I consider brothers, both of which were men more equipped to deal with a threat of any scale, being manhandled by this thing set something off in me. It was only at this moment that I realized we really could be killed by this thing, and that prompted me to open fire. I began shooting, round after round. I can still feel how much the shotgun shot back into me, and how much it hurt each time it slammed against my shoulder. But my shots only seemed to get its attention as it then changed its attention from my two friends to me, and the rest of the hunters. The men continued to fire, and so did I. After the butt of the shotgun stopped firing back into my body, I realized I had run out of bullets and began stumbling backwards away from the approaching beast. I hadn't been keeping count, but at this point, a hundred rounds had to have been fired into it. Luckily, in its frenzy, the Sandwalker had stumbled into the flames which distracted it momentarily and allowed for a few of the men to get a couple clean shots. This must have inflicted enough damage to provoke some sort of fight or flight within it, which forced it to retreat. As it then began moving down the beach, all of the men stood there, eyes wide and guns following the trail left as it ran. What I just described may seem like it was a lengthy ordeal, but in reality, I imagine it lasted no more than 30 seconds from the time we saw the grown sandwalker charging us to the time it began to retreat. As we all stood there, Griffin came stumbling down the dunes, clutching his stomach in pain. Hanging loosely from his torso was his now shattered GoPro. Two of the hunters ran to DJ and helped him to the dune buggy as he too clutched his torso. Nobody said anything. It was silent for minutes as we all tried to collect our thoughts on what just happened. The smell of the burning corpses was now replaced with the scent of gunpowder. The flares that once lit the beach were now almost completely buried by sand. We could only see what the fire and the lights of the ATVs illuminated. We didn't wait for the sun to rise. After a few words with the men, we just packed our stuff and left. The ride back was quiet, even more so than the ride there. I drove this time as DJ lied in the back seat. Griffin and I let him sleep as he seemed to catch the brunt of the damage. Luckily, the only injuries we sustained were a few bruised ribs for DJ. The wind knocked out of Griffin and the bruise on my shoulder. I pulled over at a rest stop to grab some drinks and use the bathroom about two hours into the drive. When I entered the bathroom after paying for my water, I caught a glimpse of Griffin staring at himself in the mirror. I was able to notice it momentarily during my occasional glance over at him while driving, but it became clear while looking at him in the glare at his reflection that he had been drained of every ounce of his frat boy charisma. And 
had now displayed a deadpan and defeated expression. I said the only thing I could think could possibly give him any semblance of hope. We didn't die, and we're not going back. Griffin gave a half smile, turned, and hugged me. Once we made it back to the car, we gave DJ pain meds and some snacks purchased from the rest stop. We got back to Griffin's house at 8 a.m., and I was back at my home by 8.30. When I got back, I stood in my shower for 30 minutes and just ran over what we had just gone through. I was mainly worried about how Griffin and DJ were doing. As I stepped from the shower, I looked at my phone and saw a text message from DJ in our group chat. It read, Screw the Sandwalker, and Screw North Carolina. This was followed by a text from Griffin. We messed that thing up. Love you, boys. Screw the Sandwalker. And screw North Carolina. Hello. My name is Elijah, and I am 18. When I finish this post and upload it online, I am most likely not around anymore. Or maybe I'm okay. I have no clue what they mean by fired. I've been working at my job in the fast food industry for three years now, and I've seen a lot. From terrible customers and troublesome crew, and all the standard customer service experiences, but nothing has ever been this strange or weird. I don't want to talk about myself much, but I'm yet to enroll into college, and I inspire to be a coder. I hope people don't forget about me. Anyways, I was just home in my rundown apartment just chilling on my couch watching some Netflix. I can't particularly remember what show at the moment, but that doesn't really matter. I do remember how I was startled from the sudden buzzing of my phone. I was hoping when I lifted it up to my face, my work number wouldn't appear. Of course it was them. They needed me to fill in for somebody. However, this was majorly different from before. I was being offered double my pay. Now this sounds too good to be true. It wasn't time and a half. It wasn't some holiday. No. Just a typical day. Well, if a snowstorm counts as typical. So being the broke, non-college student I am, I had to take the shift. Rent is due soon and I need any pocket money I can get. So I'm quick to press the off button for my TV and get all my work clothes. The shirt, the hat, just some basic black jeans, and the pin with my name. Since there is a storm, I also made sure to put on boots and a jacket, and I carried my work shoes and some plastic bag. At first, I was pretty fine with working. It was only 6.30 to 10.30. Four hours, nothing more, nothing less. Plus, my friend Elliot was there. We started working together, and I've been best friends ever since. I consider him to be my best friend, actually. I unlocked my apartment door and instantly, a heavy snowfall came rushing in, like it was wanting shelter from this terrible cold as well. I walk out and close the door behind me, making sure to lock it, and I rush down my apartment stairs. I nearly tripped, actually. My hands were feeling extremely cold already, and my car window needed some defrosting and also some time for the windshield wipers to actually clear everything off. To speed everything up, I do a quick wipe with my right coat, trying not to get any on my hand on the front side window. Then I move to the back to wipe off the rear side window a bit. After that, I just unlock my car and swiftly enter to get away from everything going on outside. I can't believe I am going to work with the weather like this. Well, double pay was worth it at the time. I remember thinking... I put my car keys into the ignition and started my car, putting my plastic bag onto the passenger seat as well. I set my AC to blast heat and turned the windshield wipers on. 
My seat is getting wet since the snow is melting already. I wait a couple minutes before putting my seatbelt on, backing up, and driving to work. Nothing of significance really did end up happening. Just the constant pattering of snow on my window and how fast my view would have been covered. I'm lucky technology is so great. In due time, I make it to work. I turn off my car and remove the keys from the ignition, grab my bag, get out of my car, and just close the door. And I couldn't forget to lock it. The snow already started slamming down onto me, so I just ran inside and got to the break room quickly. I switched into my work shoes but kept my coat on and clocked in. Apparently my job for today was just drive through and just that. Which was a boring one, but being honest, I really looked at my phone a lot during drive through times. I've worked through this place for a while. I could immediately tell if something different were to appear, just like someone who lived in a house for a long time could tell if something moved or if something was gone. That's when I saw it. Under the trash can, it said, For Elijah. Being curious, I picked up the paper and began reading. I don't have the paper on me, so I'm writing how I remember it. I wasn't allowed to bring it home. Also, P.S., there's so many scratched out words I recall. I think it's just for my name. Hello, Elijah. We from the management team are glad you made it. Tonight is a special night. You were offered double pay, yeah? Well, you have to earn it. Follow these simple rules, and you'll get through this shift easily. Rule 1. Pay attention to the time. Strangely enough, the clock seems to stop or just seem off sometimes. Please immediately call a manager over to fix this issue. If you don't have this issue fixed within 10 minutes of this problem occurring, strange things will happen if you don't fix it, and you will be immediately fired. Rule 2. Under no circumstances are you to serve any customers driving black vans, trucks, and so on. To be more specific, between 7 to 8 is a period where the more... tricky customers come out. You must ignore them if they drive to your window. No exceptions. If you do answer one of these people, you will be immediately fired. Rule 3. If anyone comes to your window, not inside a car, Look for anything wrong immediately. They may look normal, but we assure you, they aren't. However, some of these people may just be normal, so please talk to them. Just look out for anything that seems off when someone knocks. If you answer one of these people, you will be immediately fired. Rule 4. Don't leave the drive through window open or ajar. I need not explain. You are inviting them in you will be immediately fired. Rule 5. Please look out for Jeff. Jeff doesn't work here. Sometimes he stops by after a crew member makes a mistake with a specific rule. Please inform a manager if you spot him. He has orange hair, freckles, glasses, and lots of ring jewelry. Specifically silver and gold. If you spot Jeff and don't call it in, you will be immediately fired. Rule 6. Never leave change on the floor if any are dropped. Some may take that as payment and would like more. We hate losing money, so if you do, you'll be immediately fired. Rule 7. Do not leave your station unless a manager told you so. Sometimes a crew member may attempt to get you to leave your station and may say the manager told you to to switch. This is a lie. Don't leave your station. If you do, you'll be immediately fired. Rule 8. Lastly, never tell friends, family, or anyone about this list. If you do, you'll be immediately fired. We wish you luck, Elijah. If you'd like more hours, just call a manager and ask for them. We are working past closing hours tonight. Thank you for your great effort and amazing work. I finished reading and immediately thought about how dumb of a joke it was, but then a loud thud from the window scared me. I definitely was startled. 
A man standing outside with a coat and, oddly enough, wearing shorts. He was saying stuff about wanting to order, and can he order. My hand reached for the handle when it froze. I nearly forgot about rule three. This man was weird. It's a snowstorm out there and he's wearing shorts. I recall thinking something like, wait, is this rule stuff real then? Eventually, after tons of banging and desperate scratches at the window, I could tell something wasn't normal about the guy. Eventually, he moved on to the next window to barrage another crew member, a girl. I won't tell her name, so I'll just say Alice. Well, she ignored him too. This is like the only time I will mention her. She isn't important. So, are we getting the same rules? Why can't we talk about it? And why get fired for not following some dumb rules? I sigh, then look at the time. 10.30. My shift is over? No, impossible. I'm lucky I immediately called a manager over and yeah, the time was wrong. What's with this stuff? I'm not covering the boring business. It was snowing and... I was working at drive through For most of the time, I was just reporting the weird times and checking my phone like usual when a sudden rush at 8pm appeared. There were plenty of white cars appearing. Only white, actually. They weren't white from the snow, though, of course. I nearly forgot about the second rule when a black car appeared. It wasn't a hard rule. Just ignore them. They'll either stop at the windows or drive off immediately. It wasn't much of an issue. It was just like the people. Until later in the night when the people, not the cars, became harder to spot. Some of them looked alright, and I actually had to stand up tall just to notice how their shoes are either weird or not suited for the weather. I swear, sometimes I just got paranoid and didn't answer for real people. But hopefully there wasn't an issue for that, I hope. I was chilling when my friend Elliot walked up to my station, never entering though. Yo, Elliot, what's up my man? I immediately spoke out to him. Elliot smiled and spoke back. Man, I'm doing terrible. So cold. I'm just here to switch with you. Elliot responded somewhat casually, I think. Yet, I didn't budge. Those rules don't leave my mind. I can't switch with a crew member. And even though I know him, I didn't move. I couldn't move. A statue just stuck in the same position. Come on, man. We can switch. We're cool. Best bros. Just step out. No. I didn't speak to Elliot. He's trying to get me to break the rules. I want this job. No, no, I need this job. I remember thinking that. I don't quite believe this job actually is for me anymore, though. I outright ignored Elliot, and when my shift ended, I went home just like that. That weird night was over, and a month has passed since then. I called work and asked about Elliot. He was fired. Apparently earlier into his shift for trash-talking crew members. That isn't possible, though. Elliot would definitely not do that. But I'm sure I also saw him. He wanted me to leave my station. I check through my texts with him. Me and him casually discuss our shifts and duties and, well... I'll just put our messages here. 2.55pm. Elliot... You working today? Anyway, between 3 to 9? I'm free for there today. Unlucky. Me to Elliot. I think you mean lucky me. Drive through duty today. It's a snowstorm though. Bring a coat, bud. Of course. See you later, man. I don't want to push onwards, but it made sense to me. That out of the blue, call to work, the scratched words, and also just him being fired. He broke a rule. Was he fired? I've texted and called and Elliot is now confirmed missing. 
I haven't gone to work now, so here I am. My rent is due soon. I don't have enough money for it. So I'm typing this all for you now. I don't know what will happen to me. Most likely whatever happened to my friend. Gone and missing. Please don't forget me. Don't forget my friend either. I wonder what awaits. Death? Who would have thought working at some fast food place was this crazy? I already hear knocks at my door. They know. They are here for me. A loud honk sounded as the car in front of me came to a sudden stop. Something had dashed across the road. Something large. I slammed my foot down on the brakes and prayed the icy road wouldn't allow yet another fender bender. It was hard to make out any shapes through the thick veil of the blizzard's harrowing symphony. But I could tell that whatever had crossed the highway had done so with speed and precision. Maybe a moose, I thought to myself, paying no further mind to the matter. I reclined into my seat and turned up the volume on the radio. Frank Sinatra's I've Got You Under My Skin filled the cozy insides of my SUV, and I felt my heart rate steadily stabilize. It had been several hours since I left my hometown, and now I was surrounded by an endless expanse of white as far as the eye could see. There should have been a forest on either side of the highway, but with the severely deteriorating weather conditions, it was impossible to make out anything farther than six feet away. As I tapped my fingers on the steering wheel in perfect synchronization with the song, I grew more and more impatient. We had stood still for at least five minutes now. Surely there couldn't be this much traffic all the way out here. The song was nearly over and we still hadn't moved. Behind me, I could hear a chorus of aggressive honking. There were at least six cars behind me, and as far as I could tell, probably six in front as well. Their headlights were the only indicator of their existence, as the snow had turned everything else invisible. Then a grisly thought spread like wildfire throughout the crevices of my mind. Had there been an accident? I sat up in my seat and made an attempt to somehow peek over the top of the car ahead of me. It was futile. What's going on? I murmured under my breath as a loud sigh escaped my body. The howling winds outside violently slammed into the exterior of the car, killing any notions that I may have had about stepping out and investigating. For now, it was best I just waited it out. It would surely pass in a minute or so. I picked up my phone and started messing around with a few apps. I do not condone texting and driving, but considering we hadn't been moving for a while, I'd wager a short social media session couldn't hurt anyone. And besides, it didn't look like I was going anywhere anytime soon either. I even glanced over to the half-empty bottle of Jack Daniels that laid unassuming on the floorboard of the seat beside me, but I decided against it for now. Prior to the traffic jam, I had been visiting my extended family for the holidays back in my hometown. Due to reasons we don't need to delve into, I was forced to leave earlier than I'd initially expected, which was fine by me as I couldn't stand another second of chatty family drama and that awful holiday cheer. Forgive me if I'm sparse with the details, but for privacy's sake, I won't disclose the name of the town I departed from nor where I am currently headed. All you need to know is that the road I was traveling on was located pretty far up in the northwestern region of the United States, and it was absolutely freezing. Some time passed and the vehicles on the road hadn't moved an inch. It was as though they were rooted to the icy foundations below. Dauntingly, I observed as the car in front of me was in the process of getting devoured by the rapidly growing snowfall. Its tires were nearly completely engulfed, and I figured that it wouldn't be long until getting home in time to watch today's football game would be the least of my concerns. 
then, growing in the distance, were sirens. I looked up from my phone and directed my gaze toward the side view mirror and saw a faint blinking blue light penetrate the thicket of snow. The ambulance zoomed past me at breakneck speeds, and shortly after, a police car followed. This only reaffirmed my belief that something terribly wrong had occurred. I scrolled through my phone and continued as usual, though my digital endeavors would prove to be quite fruitless. The longer I used my phone, the worse the connection seemed to get. TikTok and YouTube videos began buffering, and other apps that required internet connectivity wouldn't even load. I'm by no means a physicist, tech guru, meteorologist, or whatever the appropriate title for this would be, but I surmise that the ongoing raging storm could be linked to the shortcomings of my phone signal. Incidentally, I was also in the middle of nowhere, 40 minutes away from the nearest settlement and 3 hours away from the closest city. The remoteness of my location would surely also have an impact on my... A light tapping on the window caught me off guard and I jolted in my seat. Crap, I thought, as the sight of a bulky police officer greeted me on the other side of the glass. By the looks of it, he had been out in the storm for way too long. His cheeks were glowing pink, and he had snowflakes stuck in his burly mustache. I quickly stowed my phone in my pocket and rolled down the window, preparing to explain why I was on my phone in traffic. But the officer didn't care about any of that. Good evening, sir. The officer started. There has been an incident further up the road. Right now, we're trying to... Could you turn that down? He gestured toward the radio. Uh, sorry, officer. Of course. I replied, dialing the scroll wheel of the volume button all the way down. As I was saying, we're trying to evacuate this, uh, whole area. Once I've gotten to the final car at the end behind you there, and I've gotten him to start backing up, I want you to follow him immediately. You want me to drive in... Reverse? I questioned. A quizzical grimace stretched across my face. Road's too narrow. Right now, I don't see any other option. Unless you want to try turning around and risk ending up in one of these ditches here. The officer said with a slight smirk. But before I had the chance to say anything else, a thundering bang sounded a couple of yards in front of us. The winds carried the sound with ear-splitting accuracy. The officer reacted immediately, hovering his hand above the pistol in his holster. He took a few steps back and tried signaling in on his shoulder-mounted radio. Another bang echoed through the harsh wind, followed by another, then another. The sounds were unmistakable. They were gunshots. He drew his pistol and rushed toward the source of the sounds. I watched as he slowly faded from view. A void of white had swallowed him whole. I stared in shock for a couple of minutes, expecting the officer to return any moment. But he never came. A small mass of snow had started accumulating inside my car, so I quickly rolled up the window. I could hear another set of muffled gunshots joining the already dominant ones. It sounded like they were completely emptying their magazines into whoever or whatever. Then, in perfect unity, the sound stopped. The silence weighed heavy as I sat in anticipation. My mind was flustered with thoughts and ideas, but the prevalent feeling that occupied my body was a creeping sensation of dread. Just what the hell was going on? I anxiously tapped my fingers on the steering wheel. In a moment of weakness, I once again looked over to the liquor bottle on the floor. I hadn't gone this long without a drink in years. One sip wouldn't hurt, right? Just to calm my nerves? If I was discreet enough, the officers would have no way of knowing. Just as I leaned over to the passenger side to pick the bottle up, my vehicle violently trembled. Something powerful had slammed into my car. I cursed loudly and rose back up, abandoning the bottle. I frantically searched around, looking for any signs of the perpetrator. 
I scanned my rear view, the side window, and even the passenger side's window. Nothing but a flurry of white specks. Then I noticed something in the blizzard in front of me. A black silhouette grew larger and larger, and soon I could make out what it was. A man? No, two men. And they were... running. Running towards my car, but these guys weren't police officers, nor any of the paramedics that had arrived earlier. They must have been the denizens of the cars in front. And then, two more people appeared behind them, either giving chase to or following the two men in front. As they inched closer, I could properly see the expressions carved into their faces. They were terrified. They looked as though they had seen a ghost. The first two men ran past my car. They didn't even look at me. Shortly after, the two people behind them followed, a woman and a boy. They hurried across the ice at great speeds while, at the same time, exercising caution so as to not slip and fall. Before I had the chance to react, they were gone, having once again been consumed by the endless white void. This was definitely cause for concern. Who in their right mind would abandon the comforts of their vehicles all the way out here, in this weather? The driver in front of me cautiously opened one of the doors to the car. A middle-aged white man with a beer gut stepped out into the cold. He slung his puffer jacket around his shoulders and stared off into the distance ahead. I watched him curiously, wondering if he too would start running and then wondering whether I should join him if he indeed decided to. Right now, it seemed illogical. But then again, these guys clearly knew something I didn't. Maybe there was a gas leak ahead. Maybe some radioactive material had been improperly disposed of. My mind raced, looking for any logical explanations for my current predicament, but I found none. The man took a few steps forward, intently inspecting the blizzard ahead. It seemed as though something had caught his attention. He took another few steps forward, positioning himself in front of his car, partially obscuring my view of him, his left side still visible. But there was something else. In the deep recesses of the snowstorm, something was moving. I strained my eyes, leaning forward in my seat and staring through my snow-covered windshield. Approaching from the left side of the road onto the oncoming lane, a large silhouette bobbed up and down as it slowly advanced toward the man. Though it was far away, it looked to be near twice his height. But he hadn't noticed it. The man was far too busy examining whatever had caught his attention directly in front of him. An overwhelming sense of dread filled my veins. The way the silhouette moved, I couldn't quite explain why, but it felt predatory. Like a lion stalking its prey through the thick underbrush of the African savanna. Right before springing into action and securing itself a fresh meal. Was it a moose? It didn't look to be. The proportions were way off, and it almost looked to be bipedal but I couldn't think of any other large animals out here that the silhouette could have belonged to. I doubted this area had ever seen any polar bears. And even so, they couldn't possibly reach this size, could they? It was like my primal instincts screamed at me to do something. I felt my fight or flight start to kick in, but I managed to keep it under wraps. I was safe inside my warm SUV. But the man, however? I had to warn him. Somehow. If I honked my horn, whatever was stalking him might have leaped into action right away. It was too risky. Before I could think of anything, the man screamed in terror. Muffled through my car's thick exterior, his cries echoed. I focused ahead of me, trying to get a glimpse of what had riled him up so badly. He turned around in an attempt to flee. He had almost made it back up to the driver's side door of his car when he planted his face into the cold, hard ground. He must have slipped. The predatory silhouette to his left was nowhere to be seen now. 
for a brief moment, I locked eyes with the man. A familiar look of excruciating fear contoured across his face. He dug his long and unkept nails into the snow, slowly crawling forwards. And then he screamed yet again, but this time, not out of fear, but in pain. Violently, he was dragged back. I watched in horror as the man tried to fight it, clutching the powdery snow as if it would actually provide a stable grip. He was dragged in front of his car and out of my view. Just before he rounded the left side corner, I could see his blood-covered hands desperately cling to the tire, and then he was pulled away. I was in complete disbelief. It was like a scene from a horror movie, except this was real. This was actually happening. The man's wailing abruptly ceased, and besides the harsh winds of the blizzard, no sound was made. I pulled out my phone and tried my best to shake the trembling in my hands as I dialed 911. As I waited for a response, I made sure all the doors were locked while I glued my eyes to the spot where I'd last seen the man. A pair of long indentations scarred the snow where he had lay, and a crimson handprint stained the black rubber of the front tire. Come on, come on, pick up already. I harshly muttered to my phone, but I never made it past the dialing tone. Was it because I had no service? I've heard that many emergency lines still operate in spite of a poor phone signal, but right now, I was inclined to believe the contrary. I eventually gave up and put my phone down. I shrunk down into my seat, making myself as small as I could. I couldn't possibly tell you how long I sat there waiting like that. The concept of time felt irrelevant at that moment. In my reclined position, I still retained a decent line of sight to the outside world. There were no signs of movement, just an empty white canvas. I could hear no discernible sounds either. I watched in what felt like slow motion as each individually unique flake of snow landed and then proceeded to melt onto the glass. The windshield wipers fought the blizzard vigorously, brushing aside everything the malevolent storm had to offer. Then suddenly, with a squelched thud, something heavy crashed down on the window, and the wipers were now smearing a vicious red liquid back and forth through the windshield. A nearly indescribable sense of paralyzing horror drilled into my very soul as I realized what I was looking at. I immediately recognized the sorrowed eyes and contorted expression of pain that draped across the poor man's face. Glistening red blood had completely dyed his hair, and the man's skin was full of lacerations and tears. But the true horror of this scene lay not with the frightful sight that greeted me. No more than twelve inches away, separated only by a cracked glass screen. No, the true horror presented itself after I finally mustered up the courage to ponder the question that I'm not even sure I wanted the answer to. Where was the rest of him? Upon the revelation that I was gazing at a freshly decapitated human head, I was compelled to scream uncontrollably at the top of my lungs, and so I did. I couldn't help it. I felt nauseous and on the verge of vomiting. It took all the strength to gather any fragment of composure that had not yet left my body, and I quickly sat up in my seat, frantically scanning my surroundings. Still, I saw nothing except a heavy downpour of snow. I tried to calm down, as I knew that panicking would only worsen whatever situation was at hand. I steadied my breathing and sat still slowly counting down from ten. However, the grotesque sight that greeted me whenever I looked through the windshield didn't exactly help. So I closed my eyes and continued counting, focusing on controlling my breathing. Inhale, exhale, inhale. But even as I closed my eyes, I still saw his face. The gruesome image had burned itself deep into my mind, and I felt anxious at the thought that I may never sleep peacefully again. 
In my distracted haze, I failed to notice that something foreign had filled the air. Something ominous. It was a deep sound, barely audible. A stark contrast to the roaring winds outside. It was the kind of sound you feel rather than hear, if that makes sense. It was deep and bellowing, and I could swear I could feel my chest faintly vibrate. Like when you're at a concert or nightclub with a really loud bass. Carefully, I rolled down my window a quarter of the way in order to better hear the curious noise. It was much clearer now, and the best way to describe it would be to call it a sort of low-pitched rumble. Its tone fluctuated ever so slightly, as if in synchronization with short, rapid breaths. It would be a rather powerful display of vocal cords if the sound was of organic origin. I tried my best to pinpoint the direction from which the sound emanated, but I found the task to be near impossible. It may have been the wind distorting and dislocating the sound, but it sounded like it originated from every direction. I didn't know what to do. Obviously, I didn't want to exit the car and make a run for it like the previous motorists before me, but I felt that staying inside the car would only render me a sitting duck. I had no weapons to protect myself either, not even a pocket knife in the glove department. The only thing I had was an old Zippo lighter, which I doubted would do any real damage in a fight. The deep rumbling subsided and was instead replaced by a hooting sound, reminiscent of that of an owl, only much deeper, like if someone blew air into a hollow tree trunk. But this sound was easy to pinpoint, and I could discern that it was coming from behind the car in front of me, where I had last seen the man before his untimely demise. I fixed my gaze toward the source of the sound expecting to see its owner peeking around the edges of the vehicle at any moment when I suddenly heard another, identical set of deep hooting coming from my left side. I wondered how the animal, or creature, or whatever it was that made those sounds had somehow managed to sneak past my line of sight, and position itself to my left without me noticing. But my wondering was cut short when the original set of hoots in front of me once again started bellowing through the winter air, as if in response to the other ones. And to my utter dismay, I slowly began to realize that whatever was making those sounds, whatever had killed that man, was not alone out here. And that's when I first saw it. As if on cue. I noticed the dominant silhouette standing in the middle of the road, contrasting itself against the rushing snowfall, slowly emerging from the harrowing blizzard. Just a few yards away from the car ahead, the creature revealed itself. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before. An abominable middle finger to all the gods' creations upon this earth. Its skull resembled that of a crocodile resting well over ten feet above the ground. It also had a large crest fixated right over its eyes, reminiscent of the horns of a bull. Its razor-sharp teeth were stained red, and blood dripped down from its maw and onto the snow-covered asphalt. The entire creature was covered in dense white fur, like that of a polar bear. No wonder I hadn't spotted it until now, it was perfectly camouflaged among the powdery white snow. The rest of the body was hard to make out due to the storm, but I could tell it was huge. Easily towering above the vehicle, it slowly approached. It moved closer, trotting towards me in a jagged fashion. Blood still dripped from its malformed mouth. It almost looked to be smiling. Almost. I looked through the cabin of the car once more desperately scouring for anything I could use to defend myself. Except for the bottle of liquor I had laying about, I was at a loss. At least I could ease the pain of being torn limb from limb by having a little alcohol in my system, I thought to myself. Seeing the creature uncomfortably close now, I made an attempt to just drive away. It was true what the officer had said previously about the road being extremely narrow, but in the face of certain death, I figured it was worth a shot. 
though as I was boxed in by both a car in my front and one in my rear, I would have to succeed at a difficult maneuver in order to make my escape. A maneuver I wasn't too sure I could make in these perilous conditions. But I had to try. I applied my foot down onto the gas pedal, and the tire spun around in the snow, slinging bits of debris everywhere. Still stationary, I pressed down even harder, hoping to God that I would break free from my frozen constraints. In my panic, I gazed ahead and locked eyes with the creature. I could feel its wicked stare burrow deep into my soul. The wheels kept spinning, but I wasn't making any progress. I had waited too long. It was as I had feared earlier. I was trapped. There was nowhere to go. An ear-splitting hoot sounded just a few yards away, and I saw the creature had stopped in its tracks. It raised its head and let out another hoot. What the hell do you want? I sobbed, punching the steering wheel in frustration. The wretched thing cocked its head and let out yet another vocalization. It was as if it wanted to grab my attention, or to distract me. Before I knew it, I felt a searing pain aching throughout my body and my world was turned upside down as a powerful force slammed into the left side of the car, sending it flying. The SUV toppled over, accompanied by the sounds of crushing metal. Thankfully I was wearing my seatbelt, or else I would have probably broken my neck while tumbling around inside the car like dirty laundry in a washing machine. When the car eventually came to a stop, I found myself suspended upside down in the driver's seat. The vehicle had rolled down into the nearby ditch on the side of the road. Below me on the inside of the car's roof were fragments of shattered glass and heaps of snow. I hadn't quite processed what had happened, so I sat there for a moment taking it all in. Suddenly everything felt so calm and quiet. I questioned if I had even survived the ordeal. A warm liquid flowed down from my chin into my mouth and then down the rest of my face. The stinging copper taste made me snap out of my trance and I began to assess the situation. Outside I heard heavy thuds rapidly approaching the vehicle. Each mighty stomp struck down into the snow with rhythm, and I could imagine the creature's mouth practically foaming at the prospect of a fresh new meal. The footsteps came to a sudden halt right outside the driver's side window, and I turned my head to get a better look. A set of two large and powerful hind legs stood mere inches away from my face. They were covered in what looked to be reptilian-like scales lined with dense white fur, and the creature had three long talons that protruded from each foot. The deafening scraping of metal filled the air as I imagined the creature began clawing away at the undercarriage of the SUV. From the fast-paced shifting of the monster's feet, I began to understand the sheer ferocity with which it attacked. It was going ballistic, shredding the exterior at an incredibly fast rate. A combination of hoots and growls escaped its bloodthirsty jaws as it chipped away at the metal. It wouldn't be long until it was through. Another pair of heavy footsteps stopped just a short distance away on the opposite side of the car, right outside the passenger's side window. Like its predecessor, it too began clawing and kicking at the body of the car. The two creatures were relentless. I'd never seen anything like it. Not even wild hyenas were this ravenous. I braced for impact as I unbuckled my seatbelt, positioning myself in such a manner so that I wouldn't break my neck upon impact. I hit the ground hard, and was greeted by the sensation of cold snow and broken glass. The car rocked back and forth as the creatures violently attacked. It was obvious I couldn't stay in here for long, but escaping the crushed remains of my vehicle and running out on foot didn't seem favorable either. I felt a deep desperation begin to set in as I realized I would most likely not live to see another day. This was it. Just as all hope had faded, and I began to accept my fate, 
My arm brushed up against a cold and oblong object. I shifted my body around to see what it was, and a light bulb ignited inside my head as I gazed upon the still intact bottle of liquor that laid on the floor. My hands trembled as I reached deep into my pocket and extracted my old Zippo lighter. However, I examined the Jack Daniels and gauged that the contents inside would not be enough for the powerful reaction I was hoping for. So I opened the gloved compartment and began searching. Uh, there it is. I cheered as my fingers grazed upon the bottle of scented hand sanitizer. An old relic from the pandemic. It was nearly full as well. I opened the two bottles and began pouring the disinfected alcohol down into the half-empty liquor bottle. The sanitizer mixed in with a strong bourbon would surely be enough for an improvised Molotov cocktail. I ripped off a piece of cloth from my shirt and stuffed it down the bottleneck. With the Molotov in hand, I crawled toward the cracked windshield. I spun around and pressed my feet against the shattered glass frame in an adrenaline-infused state. I pressed my legs down and applied pressure to the windshield. I strained my body and pushed my legs harder than I had ever done before in my life, wishing I'd spent more time at the gym prior to this. Due to its severely damaged condition, it didn't take long before the windshield came off, and the harsh winds of the outside world filled the cabin of the upside-down car. Above me, the creatures growled and bellowed, ripping and tearing away at the framework. I could see narrow slivers of light begin to penetrate the underside of the car, meaning they were nearly through. I crawled through the new opening and out into the unforgiving blizzard. I feared that as soon as I stepped outside, one of the creatures would promptly place my head in its jaws and I would be done for. But that never came. It seemed that they were too preoccupied with getting through the hard exterior of the SUV, and they had failed to notice that I had made my crafty escape. I kept crawling along the snow, praying to God that the beasts wouldn't turn their hideous heads and discover the easy meal slithering away right beside it. I didn't dare look back either. I couldn't bring myself to face the abominable animals. Once I had achieved a satisfactory distance away from the car, I finally turned around and rose to my feet. I ignited my lighter and set the Molotov cocktail ablaze. Don't try this at home, by the way. With all my remaining strength, I hurled the flaming bottle at the heap of scrap metal that used to be my car and watched in glory as the fire began to rise. I even think I hit one of the creatures as I heard a dazzled yelp cry out. The flames weren't nearly big enough to cause a massive explosion or anything, but it was just enough to distract the creatures so that I was able to make a run for it. I ran back onto the road and continued past all the vacant cars and stood further up. The ice was painted red, and a couple of human corpses, or at least what remained of them, were strung about the various abandoned vehicles. Eventually, I came upon the ambulance and the police car that had arrived about an hour prior. There were no signs of the officer who had talked to me, but deep down I knew what kind of fate had befallen him. In the distance, I heard ominous rumbling sounds come from one of the creatures, followed by agitated hooting. Had they finally noticed I was gone? In that case, I didn't have a lot of time. I got inside the ambulance and planted myself down in the driver's seat. A frozen and severed human hand was attached to the steering wheel. I gagged as I ripped it off and tossed it out the open window. The creature's shrill cries echoed through the snowstorm, and it sounded like they were coming closer. Desperately, I turned the ambulance's ignition, and to my delight, it started up without a hitch. I kicked my foot down on the gas pedal and floored it out of there. Luckily for me, ambulances in this part of the United States come well equipped to handle hazardous terrain and snow-covered roads. As I drove, I intently watched the rearview mirror, hoping I would get at least a glimpse of one of the monsters. But the only things I saw were whirling snowflakes, 
dancing effortlessly along the icy winds that carried them. About 30 minutes of driving later, I arrived at a small town. The blizzard had begun to let up, and the sun was starting to set on the horizon. I parked outside the first roadside hotel I found, and must have looked like a zombie as I frantically begged the receptionist to alert the authorities. She looked extremely nervous, but did as I told her. After a while of talking, the kind receptionist informed me that the police would stop by first thing tomorrow morning. Apparently the nearest police station was an hour's drive away, and the raging storm had caused major problems across infrastructure all over the state. Seeing as how nobody was in immediate danger, they would wait until the roads were cleared and traversal was safe again. I wasn't happy with this response. But I was too tired to really care. I checked into one of the hotel rooms and began typing all this out on my phone. There are still so many questions left unanswered, but I imagine tomorrow will bring more news about the situation. I just hope that the other motorists along the highway made it out okay, but I have my doubts. The blizzard has now subsided, and outside my second story window, I am treated to a view of the clear night sky and the endless expanse of the tundra. I'll admit, this landscape is beautiful, though it's a shame that I will now forever associate the tranquility of snowfall with the abhorrent horror of events prior. However, that is not all. Since it was getting hot in my room, I decided to crack my window slightly ajar. For the past hour, I have been listening to the breeze floating across the frozen countryside. There are no sounds of wild animals out there, oddly enough, but there is something else. Occasionally in the distance, the silence is broken by the ever so familiar and foreboding sound of a faint hoot crying out into the night. The air was alive with the sound of chatter. Cutlery and glasses clinked against the worn wooden tables, and the smell of cuisines from across the world mingled and danced under my nose. A handful of servers weaved between the tightly packed tables, carrying dishes of every color and flavor. Deftly navigating the throngs of customers entirely too wrapped up in their own conversations to make room. That was how I found myself on that brisk Saturday evening, standing by the door to the kitchen, surveying my domain. Business was good, as usual, and it seemed the steady stream of custom wasn't letting up. I offered an encouraging smile to Emily, one of our junior servers, as she burst out the door with two bowls of curry on one arm and a plate of rabanada on the other. She wearily returned the gesture. Suddenly from around the corner to the main entrance came Jack, 19 years old and our newest recruit. I'd placed him at the front desk, taking reservations and greeting guests until he got a lay of the land. My instructions were clear. He was only to leave his post for his allotted break, which wouldn't be for another 90 minutes. Or if... One of your special clients is here, sir, he whispered breathlessly, eyeing the nearest table to make sure he wasn't being overheard. Two generous servings of Dong Po pork, and what appeared to be the table's third bottle of wine made the possibility unlikely. He continued, The gentleman says his name is Mr. Miller, and he'd like to see you. I smiled. Ashton Miller is discreet, and tips generously. He's always welcome. Excellent. Send him this way. I replied briskly, and he nodded, turning back to the entrance. And Jack? He turned his head back. I appreciate your discretion, as you'll see in the month's pay. Jack nodded again this time with a smile and disappeared around the corner. 
Ashton Miller, a lean, gangly man in a thick overcoat, staggered into the restaurant proper a few moments later. His springy curls were hidden behind a blue bobble hat, and much of his lower face behind a woolen scarf. He's clearly stolen the two from different people because they went together horribly. A simple face mask and a high collar, and all that was visible of the man were a pair of beady eyes which darted about before landing on me. He stiffened up and strode over. Evening, friend. He murmured. Each word came labored from Ashton, monotone and with a resonant after sound like his throat were a great bell. Compared to my more gabby customers, he was a welcome change. Good evening, Mr. Miller. Shall we? I gestured to a door marked manager only down the other side of the room, and Ashton eagerly nodded. The pom-pom on his hat bouncing ridiculously. On the other side of the door was my office, a simple but respectable affair with a rich oak desk, a row of cheap filing cabinets on one wall, and a bookcase on the other. I reached behind the bookcase and flicked a switch, and the whole thing swung out, the entrance to a spiral staircase in its place. Back during the Prohibition era, this place had been a speakeasy. Luckily for my purposes, the whole restaurant had shut down in 1923, so the unregistered basement remained a secret. Now only I and my clientele have any clue of its existence. Ashton had to duck a little to fit down the staircase, the top of his hat still scraping against the top. As we neared the bottom, a warm orange glow could be seen from the room beyond, and at last, we stepped out into the bar. A series of small candlelit chandeliers lit the length of the room, along one side of which ran the bar itself. Rows upon rows of little corked bottles sat on shelves behind the bar all adorned with handwritten labels. The labels were in a code only I knew, which meant that nobody but I could tell which drink would give you the best buzz of your life, and which would burn a hole through your esophagus. It helps to discourage theft in a world where the police getting involved isn't an option. A shoddily shaved man with a wide-brimmed hat sat slumped on one of the bar stools, surrounded by a half-dozen empty shot glasses, all of them emitting small wisps of smoke. With one hand, the man was holding a glass over his outstretched tongue, hoping to catch a non-existent last drop of drink. With another, he drummed the top of the bar, as if impatiently waiting for something. With a third, he adjusted the brim of his hat, while the rest danced around his jacket, feeling at various pockets. His droopy form immediately snapped upright as I entered, and a Cheshire cat grin spread impossibly wide across his face. Hey, hey boss. He called in a reedy, East London accent. His arms all sprung forward lifting him off the bar and dropping him to the floor, from which he bounced to his feet to face us. I shivered involuntarily at the uncanny sight. And Ashton, it's been too long, my friend. How are you keeping? Ashton stared impassively in response. The man nodded for a few moments, encouraging Ashton to speak, but eventually gave up. So, boss, here's the thing, yeah? I'm fresh out at the minute, but you get me one last drink for the night, and I'll pay my tab first thing in the morning. What do you say? I say you're done for the night, Skint. I said, eyeing the empty glasses as an excuse not to meet the eyes of the spindly giant. You want more? You come back tomorrow. I prayed my fear wasn't audible. My clients are usually smart enough not to bite the hand that feeds them, but 
But the fact that Skint could tear my limbs from my body as easily as rip the wings off a butterfly was impossible to ignore at moments like this. Skint didn't react for a moment, then two of his arms jerked towards me. His fingers flared with razor-sharp nails. My heart leapt to my throat, and I stumbled back, but each arm was quickly restrained by two more before it could reach me. Skint laughed nervously. <laughs> Sorry about them, boss. They get awfully rowdy without their drink. He paused for a moment, smiling desperately at me, then relented. Right, yep. You got it, boss. I'll be back tomorrow. All but two of Skint's arms retracted into his jacket, and, tipping his hat as he passed us, he headed upstairs, muttering to himself, Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Apologies, Mr. Miller. I said, composing myself as we made for the wall opposite the bar, where a couple of booths were hidden from the main area by a set of curtains. Ashton sat at the table, then wheezed. <laughs> My usual, please. I nodded and stepped back from the booth, drawing the curtain back into place. Ashton likes his privacy, especially while eating. I walked behind the bar and to the door of the walk-in freezer. In its speakeasy days, the room had been a mere larder, but now a refrigeration unit chugged quietly in the corner, and frost covered the walls. Various carcasses hung from hooks in the ceiling, and I quickly selected one. For most clients, a specific cut was desired. Ashton was anything but picky, however, and with a cleaver I took from a rack on the wall, I severed a whole leg. The carcass was returned to the hook, and I took the leg with me. On the way back to Ashton, I chose a bottle from the shelf behind the bar. On its label was a semicircle bisected by a straight, horizontal line, followed by a triangle. Perfect. I returned to the booth and passed the leg and the bottle to Ashton through the curtain. We sometimes talked as he ate, something with which I hoped his drink would help him. But this time he said something he'd never said before. A break from routine was something most unusual to Ashton, so I took notice. Would you sit with me? He croaked from behind the curtain. I felt my composure drop a little, but it quickly returned. Of course, Mr. Miller, if that's what you'd like. I ducked behind the curtain and sat opposite Ashton, who had removed his hat and scarf and was in the middle of taking off his mask. A shot of ice went through my blood as his face was revealed, and I had to force myself to maintain eye contact. His mandibles clicked together in anticipation of his meal, and he uncorked the bottle and took a swig. With a sickening series of snaps and crunches, Ashton's chitinous thorax receded as the drink graced his throat, and at last, an unlabored breath came to him. Thank you, Ashton said with a relieved sigh. That's much better. He took the leg from the table and, beginning at the thigh, brought his mandibles down upon it. He cut through the flesh like warm butter, finally stopping as he hit the bone. His jaws snapped together again and again on the stump of bone, wearing it away rather than breaking it. At last, the bone was weakened enough that Ashton snapped off the stump, silently crunching away at it for a few moments until it disappeared down his gullet. He then proceeded a little further down the leg and continued. My throat burned with bile at the sight, but I managed to keep myself together, if a few shades paler than before. Things have been rough out there. He spoke between bites. Lots been going on. I must confess I've been out of the loop. I replied, trying to maintain my light tone. Aside from Skint and yourself, 
I haven't had any customers down here for a month now. This fact had been a source of concern as of late, but my clients aren't exactly the reliable sort. So I'd assume this unusually long slump was just a passing phase. Ashton nodded. Well, that'll be why. People scared to be seen congregating. Rat trappers been getting folks nervous. If I had been behind the curtain, I would have rolled my eyes despite myself. Operation Rat Trap has been running for over 30 years, and the most success I'd heard of them having was taking out Herbert Briggs in O2. Briggs was one of Skint's drinking buddies, and the most reckless, idiotic man I'd ever met. In fact, I half suspect his liver got to him first, and the trappers only took the credit after the fact. In short, if that was the best they could do, I could afford to pay the rat trapper's little mind. Ashton must have noticed my reaction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. The trapper's getting people nervous. I'd be skeptical too. But they aren't some underfunded band of secret service wannabes anymore. Seems someone in high places is taking an interest in their work believing we might be real. They've been stepping up their work. A tingling of nerves went through me. For the first time about something outside the room, Ashton was reliable, not prone to fear. If he was worried about the trappers, they might really be becoming an issue. I tried to compose myself. Well, I wouldn't worry too much. I said with what I hoped was confidence. If the trappers get too bold, Dalton will sort them out. Remember in 08 when they stumbled across one of his places? Three dead agents and no leads. That scared them off for a while. Ashton, who had now reached the lower tibia, leaned back in his seat, cocking his head to the side sympathetically. I'm sorry to tell you this, friend, but... Dalton's dead. They got him. Ashton's words hit me like cannonballs. Dalton? Dead? Impossible. I remembered the crack in the far side of the bar where he'd once thrown Briggs for taking a sip from his drink. His arms had bulged to the size of tree trunks, and if Briggs hasn't stretched his neck a couple of meters free of the bar... He might have killed him there and then. As it was, he'd broken four ribs, and had walked with a limp every time I'd seen him. Someone like Dalton couldn't just die, not to a bunch of amateurs playing detective. Dalton? I managed to choke out, completely abandoning my professional demeanor. Are you sure? Ashton nodded. Clark and Jobs, too, he said wistfully. As I said, people are getting scared. Ashton finished his meal, sliding the last of the foot into his mouth. He paused for a moment, then began hacking, his breath coming in short, desperate gasps. At last, he choked up five half-dissolved toenails onto the table. Apologies, my friend. They never quite agreed with me. Ashton sighed, satisfying. Delicious as ever. I will certainly be coming back, no matter what the others say. Pay them no mind, Mr. Miller. I said, my professionalism slowly returning. Even if the rat trappers are getting bolder, you'll always be safe here. I'll make sure of it. That I am sure of. Ashton choked out, the rigidity slowly returning to his throat. Uh, seems time to leave. Ashton donned his mask, hat, and scarf, and I joined him back up the stairs. He slipped me a check as we walked. It would cover the next two months of the lease on the restaurant. I thanked him for his generosity, which he brushed off. Price 
worth the service. He said. I couldn't quite tell under the mask, but he might have been smiling. I bid Ashton farewell and was left alone to once again survey the restaurant from my vantage point near the kitchen door. The atmosphere was as alive as ever, but tainted ever so much by Ashton's revelation. Did my clients really think my restaurant was no longer safe for them? Was all my preparation and care not enough for them? Might it not be enough? I dismissed the thought. This place was my home. It was my livelihood. More than that, it was their sanctuary. I wasn't going to let them take it away. That brings us to the present. This has been a message to the rat trappers. I know you comb the internet for mention of my clients, so this will no doubt make it to you. I know you won't be able to ignore a confession, much less a challenge, for that's what this is. You may have won some early victories, but these people have been hunted since the dawn of humanity, and have hunted you right back more than effectively. And they have me. I will continue to post about my experiences, to show my clientele they have nothing to fear. To which you have two possible responses. You may step back. You may retreat back to the light, where monsters don't exist and where people just go missing. Or you can stay. You can try to stop me. You can come looking for a war. And you'll find one. Fifteen years ago, my friends and I visited a winter carnival. It was bright and noisy and packed. It was wonderful and it was huge. There were rides, blinking and tooting as people went around and round or up and down screaming and laughing. There were food stalls which smelled of salt and oil and sugar. There were heavily tattooed folks lifting things and moving them around or gathered in small groups smoking and chatting. There were families and young lovers and teens running amok. My friends and I spent hours there, four twenty-somethings looking at the kishy things the carnies were hawking, eating until we were almost sick, and riding rides until we actually got sick. It was heaven. Late in the evening, as we wandered the ground, Susan stopped suddenly and held her arms out to the side, stopping us as well. Look! She exclaimed as she pointed between a tent and a dart game. There's an arrow in the path leading down there. She turned to look at the other three of us, her black hair fanning out from the speed which which she turned. Let's follow it. I bet there's something amazing down there. Nah said her boyfriend Dave, reaching out to take her hand in an attempt to pull her away from the alley. It's probably a staff marking. I doubt it's for the customers. Let's go over to the darts. I'll win you a stuffed animal. Susan wasn't having it though, and she insisted that we follow the arrow. She was one of those people who was a force of nature, so it only took a minute for her to convince us that we should check it out. I mean, maybe it'll be nothing. Maybe Dave's right and we just find crew stuff, but maybe... She leaned forward as her eyes grew wide. Maybe it's something amazing. Susan and Dave led us down the close alley between attractions. After only a few steps, the sounds and smells of the carnival dimmed until they were completely gone. Then we heard a soft violin and smelled incense. A few steps later, I looked between Susan and Dave to see a softly lit purple and blue stripped tent with a black awning under which glowed the yellow light of the candle illuminating the door. Susan turned to us and whispered, See? Something amazing. She was giddy and, before anyone could respond, Susan was through the door and there was nothing else to do but follow her. Inside the tent, it was warm and warmly lit by several candles. 
In the center of the tent was a low table covered in a cloth which matched the tent. Sitting at the table was a gray-haired woman with a long braid and a face full of wrinkles. We saw her look up and smile, showing off pearly white teeth and a dimple in her cheek. It was everything you imagine when you think of fortune tellers. Good evening, children. The woman stood when my best friend Leah walked into the tent. I'm glad you chose to follow my sign. I was hoping you would visit me tonight. Now sit, sit. I will read your futures. I will tell you three things which will happen before you die, and since you're a young bunch, I will tell you when that will be. There were three chairs positioned near the walls of the tent, and one across from hers at the table. I'm not a believer in fortune telling or those kinds of supernatural things, but the fact that there were exactly the right amount of chairs for us was a little unsettling. Dave, Leah, and I sat in the chairs on the perimeter, and Susan sat in the one at the table. Of course, she would go first. This was all her doing anyway. We watched intently as the fortune teller pulled out a thick deck of cards and asked Susan to cut the deck and then choose a card. Oh, you picked the princess. A very good avatar. I think your future will be bright. As she read the cards, the fortune teller spoke of a broken heart, a beloved child, and a large sum of money. I listened with a small smirk because the predictions were so generic and positive. This woman put on a good show, but no one knows the future. Then she told Susan the date of her death. July 19th, 2019. Susan nodded and thanked the woman, commenting that she hoped the money came before the baby as she took Dave's seat and he walked to the table to hear his fortune. The fortune teller looked him over and then held out her bony hand, inviting him to place his hand in hers. She lifted the glasses which had been hanging around her neck and slid them onto her ears as she leaned over his hand and nodded. She told him that his lifeline was strong, but his love line was short. She looked up into his eyes with sympathy as she told him that he would find a fulfilling job working with his friends, would escape death once, and would die with a broken heart. His expiration date was November 3rd, 2020. I saw her pull a piece of paper out of her purse and write something down as Dave walked back to Leah, switching places with her. She whispered, I wonder what generic thinks she'll tell me, and then swaggered to the table where she sat at the fortune teller, sat stirring whatever was in the mug beside her. The fortune teller asked Leah to hold the mug between her hands in the center of the table as she looked into it. I assumed, and Leah later confirmed, that it was tea and the fortune teller was reading leaves in the beverage. Oh. A smile slid up the fortune teller's face as she stared into the mug. No babies for you. Which is what you want, eh? You will travel all over the country, and you will be happy. She looked up into Leah's eyes. I know you won't believe me but you will be very happy until March 12th, 2022. Leah sucked in a breath, and then stood to trade places with me. I remember thinking that all of this was very well done, but that it couldn't be real as I walked to take my seat across from the woman, who asked me to put my head down on my arms on the table so that she could touch my head. I complied, thinking that was odd, and then a shiver ran down my spine as I felt her fingers slide into my hair and trace slowly over my scalp. I heard my friends as they changed position, probably leaning forward to hear what my fortune would be as she began to speak softly. You will achieve your dreams. Three babies. She paused as her fingers continued to move. A loving husband. And you will be a teacher until... I held my breath as she concentrated. Until February 1st, 2023. 
I let out my breath in a gasp because I realized how specific Leah and my fortunes had been. How could this woman have known? Maybe this really was real. I think she heard that gasp and realized what I had concluded because she leaned close and whispered, Don't worry too much, dear. He will take good care of those babies. With that, she patted my hand, bid us good evening, and ushered us back into the night. When we got back to the carnival proper, Susan was stoked. She was bouncing on the balls of her feet, barely containing her excitement. I know what we have to do, y'all. We should get tattoos of our expiration dates. I was a little shaken up, but Susan's exuberance was contagious, and we headed to the closest tattoo place to get our tats. We should have taken it more seriously. Since then, I have stayed in my hometown, living the beautiful life of my dreams as I watched my friends live the lives of the fortune teller predicted. Susan had a man leave her at the altar, another join her there before giving her a beautiful girl whom she named after me. And then she won the lottery. She used some of the lottery money to buy a trip to Hungary to see where her ancestors came from. Well there, her taxi was in an accident, and she died on July 19th, 2019. Dave became a carpenter. He loved every minute of his work, and then went home to his beautiful wife and spunky son each night. In 2020, he died with a broken heart, having lived just long enough to watch his family succumb to the pandemic, which passed him over before he took his life on November 3rd, 2020. Leah and I stayed together the weekend of that funeral. We were scared because we had also been living the lives the fortune teller had predicted. She was single, free, and traveled often for work. She had seen every wonder of the continental US, been to countless zoos and museums, and was living her best life. And she might only be able to live it for another two years. It was the same for me. I had two children and another on the way, a husband who loved me passionately, and a classroom which brought me joy every day. We racked our brains to try to remember the name of the carnival, or the name of the fortune teller, thinking we should go back to her and see if she could help us somehow. We made all kinds of plans for our expiration dates, finally agreeing to making sure we were together on March 12th, and February 1st. I watched my best friend die on March 12th, 2022. We were sitting at a coffee shop in a big city talking about how Leah's tattoo had been itching lately and wondering if it was a psychosomatic as her date approached when a car drove by and opened fire. The shooter sprayed the front of the shop with bullets and one of them hit Leah in the head and killed her almost instantly. I watched her grimace, and then I watched the light fade from her eyes as she passed. Well, it's almost my expiration date. I am a believer. I have a few days left, and I am still frantically searching for the woman, or the carnival, or anyone who can help me. I've taken the rest of the month off so I can spend the days looking for a way out, and the evenings enjoying my family and trying not to cry. I have written letters to each of them, and post-dated them to be delivered on February 2nd. I'm writing this last bit on my phone as I walk. It's 15 years to the day since we had our fortunes told, and the carnival is back in town. I didn't spend as much time here as I did when my friends were with me. I didn't eat myself sick or ride any rides. I wandered around looking for the dart game and the arrow on the ground until I found it. I'm standing at the top of the alley, my stomach churning at the thought of walking down and finding the tent. I don't have much hope, but my tattoo itches, and I think I smell incense.
I can still remember what life used to be like. It's crazy to make that statement about something that transpired a little under a year ago, as though it happened in a bygone era of the past. The reality, though, is that nothing is the same. Nothing. The story that's been passed along through those of us that remain is that it all started in the state of Georgia last fall. It seems that a young man in his 20s was deer hunting on his family farm when he witnessed a large antlered buck stand and walk on two legs for just a few moments, as though he was a humanoid before, resetting back to four legs and carrying on with chasing does. He even claimed that the entire muscle structure of the deer had changed, but he also reasoned that all the beers from the night before might have altered his coherency. Nonetheless, that didn't stop him from pulling the trigger on his grandpa's old .264 Win Meg and dropping the animal in its tracks from 150 yards away. Everything appeared to be business as usual for the young hunter, as he proceeded to load the buck into his Chevy pickup and haul it back to the family barn to hang for a few days to allow the meat to age and tenderize. Normally a hunter would have gutted the deer in the field, but this young man reasoned that he'd just take care of that once it was hoisted up high in the barn. No sooner had he accomplished getting the deer hung, and winched before he grabbed his weathered pocket knife and proceeded to make the first incision into the buck's abdomen. What occurred at that moment is what would change life as we know it. You see, as soon as that blade pierced hide, the antlers to the buck began to sprawl out longer and longer until finally they formed a four-digit appendage. Next thing the young man knew, his own knife was drawn across his neck, and he fell to the ground gasping for air as his jugular had been severed. The father of this young man rounded the corner just in time to see the being standing on two legs over his struggling son. He had just enough time to grab his own lever-action rifle propped up against the doorway, and cycle a shell into the chamber before it turned around to face him. In what seemed like a mirage, the being hazily transformed into the very likeness of his son. Being obviously conflicted, he found himself unable to pull the trigger as he aimed on its chest. The scenario became even more bizarre, when from under scalp of this human-like being began to sprout antlers. Not just spikes, a full 5x5 five five rack. The farmer snapped out of it just in time to begin pulling the trigger again, but the humanoid took notice and was immediately on him, goring his torso with its rack. Supposing the old man to be dead, the being proceeded to waltz out of the barn and into the house where it murdered his wife. As best as anyone can configure from this entire situation, these beings have the ability to communicate worldwide. The reasoning behind this hypothesis is that they overtook the entire world that very night. And by they, I mean the deer. Not just one variety or subspecies of deer, by the way. All of the antlered creatures of the planet, the elk, moose, stags, mule deer, black tail, white tail, fallow, axis, and so on and so on. They marched the neighborhoods of mankind that night and proceeded to slaughter every human they came across and steal their physical identity with a set of antlers being added to the new look. I was only spared that evening because my, honestly, quite privileged family was flying on a private jet that evening. The news caught us just in time to keep us from landing at our runway in Los Angeles. My father directed the pilot to take us to our family's private island in the Pacific. My dad's theory was that, given the lack of wildlife on the island, we'd be safe. His theory proved wrong. As we sat in the great room with my grandfather's and great-grandfather's trophy game heads on the wall and watched the live stream on the news, I heard a ripping sound. Before I had time to react, a seemingly malleable appendage burst through my father's chest and then withdrew as it took on the outline of my father and, you guessed it, sprouted antlers. 
It was then that I noticed the game heads were all missing their antlers. The antlers were a living entity for all of these years, and had escaped the mounts. I won't bore you with the entirety of my trauma and survival of that evening. I'll simply tell you that I was the only member of seven people, plus the pilot, that escaped the yacht that night and traversed into the wide open ocean. I eventually dared to anchor towards land six days later to retrieve supplies. I soon learned that, much like everyone figured deer behaved, these entities rest during the day. So then, the chance of sneaking through a town to retrieve non-perishable goods and fuel was better around noon. I only went when absolutely necessary, and took as much as I could at each excursion. You see, the sad reality is that the existing foods on the shelves out there will likely outlive me. What I found to be true was that they killed almost all of humanity that evening. The food is abundant, the fuel will eventually be a challenge, but with only a year having passed, that's not my first concern. Don't get me wrong, I've seen signs of other survivors in my travels up and down the west coast. But I've never met anyone in person after that fateful night. It's the good old ham radios that have facilitated my human interactions. We are a small community worldwide of about 300. From what we've estimated, but we stay in constant connection and accountability with each other. We've managed to figure a few things out about our enemy. One of our survivors is an archaeologist, and he believes that these hooved species hadn't originated with antlers on their male counterparts. Ancient cave drawings depict deer as not having antlers going way back. This has given us the theory that the entity took residence in these creatures in the form of antlers atop their scalps ages ago. Of course, our most significant findings in this department was the ability to survive indefinitely so long as the antlers retain their structure. This is why game head mounts across the world killed many people in a seeming covert-like strike. It's as though they hoped they would be hunted and displayed as part of their plan. Their intelligence has proved tricky to decipher. In personal confrontations, we found them to be simply tyrannical in their ferocity, and insanely quick in their reflexes, but not altogether cunning. I myself have narrowly escaped death a few times in my supply runs. I believe only because I dealt with individuals and not herds. That being said, their true strength lies in their communication with one another. It's an almost eerie, hive-like system in which they are receiving orders and acting in unison. This is how they manage to conquer the world, we believe. As far as killing them, we have found that gunshots aimed to shatter the antlers themselves, especially more at the base of the rack, do kill the being permanently. Before you get too excited, though, we found that very rarely does a bullet strike its target given their reflexes unless you manage to catch one resting, which they rest in herds, of course. You might think killing the host form first and then smashing the antlers would be plausible, but it's not. The reality is that they are now on the offense, so anyone who kills the host form soon finds themselves one of my radio pals, Alec from Australia. Claims he shattered one with a baseball bat, but who could prove or disprove that claim? To say the least, life is, well, not life anymore. I've lived in isolation for going on 372 days now. I've spent many moments pondering the very purpose of the struggle of it all, to just exist in general. But I came to a conclusion a couple of months ago, and it just might change everything. I would rather know that my life had some impact on the world, so I decided to declare war on them slash it, whatever this is. It's funny how the fear of death being taken out of the equation can change literally everything. But, sure enough, that's what it took to get my creative juices flowing. I knew getting closer was never a safe option, so I had to think distance. 
I started to observe them and I soon discovered that they still retained their herbivore tendencies, even in human form. They actually ate like animals in a very primitive and gluttonous way, as though it's their last meal with no caution to their surroundings. So, I began to poison their various food sources with anything I could find. Antifreeze, drain cleaners, it didn't matter. I just needed it to make them sick. Since they travel mostly in large herds, I was finding myself unloading boxes of ammo each day from large-scale rooftops at the antlers of herds that lay lethargic and despondent in the streets. The fascinating part of it all was that, just like a hive, a new member will appear to take the place of a missing position in the herd. You might think this depressing to feel like you aren't accomplishing anything when you return day by day to the same numbers. The merit of it all came together though when I found myself only picking off stragglers in the streets of Los Angeles and realizing that I had finally killed everything in the area. So, my journey took me all over the state, and within a month, I had refined my methods to the point that I cleared most of the large cities in California. Even better though, was that my friend across the world started doing the same thing. We did lose a few of us in the worldwide battle, but in the last two months we've accomplished taking back many of major cities in the world. In fact, some of my friends began to rendezvous in person and recolonize areas. They even began fortifying them. We found the safest method of surviving, though, was to remain out at sea a few miles in the evening until we were certain our newly reclaimed territories could be made impenetrable. I myself had been talking to a woman named Gabriela along the western coast of Mexico throughout this entire catastrophe, and we finally decided to meet in person and perhaps start something in our part of the world. We decided to meet along the coast today. It was near sunset when I caught sight of her boat. I climbed aboard and called for her with no answer to be heard. Fearing the worst, I entered the cabin and found her there. Her face marred beyond human recognition and her hands clutching a shotgun. There were empty shells littering the room and pellet holes all over the walls. That's when I heard a thud out on deck. As I peeked through the windows, my heart fell to my stomach. It was a whole flock of seagulls with antlers. I've barricaded and boarded up the cabin as best as I can, but I know my chances are not great at surviving this. I warned the others over the radio and told them that I thought underground might be the next best hope at saving our race. I had plans to attempt steering this rig towards shore and making a run for cover on land. But the splashes and bumps I felt earlier removed my ambition as I felt the boat begin to sink. You see, I just pried a board open and peeked over the balcony into the waters. As I write this, my boat is being bombarded on all sides by a school of dolphins, and they all have antlers. I am 49 years old, 50 in a couple of months, too old to be frightened of the stories my grandmother told me during the long winter nights, when my parents were visiting their friends and it was just the two of us sitting in front of the fire. I shouldn't even remember them, and yet, I still avert my gaze from the bathroom mirror if I happen to be there between midnight and 3 o'clock in the morning. I've heard people refer to those hours as the witching hours. My grandmother never called them that or any other name. When I asked her, why shouldn't I look in the mirror at that time of night? She just shrugged her shoulders and simply said, because they look back, and once they see you... She left the rest of the sentence hanging there, unfinished, unspoken, in the space between us. She didn't need to say it. We both knew what she was speaking of. 
Like I said, I am too old to be thinking about silly stories told by an elderly woman to entertain and, in equal measure, frighten a gullible child. It's not her stories that stop me looking in the mirror in the middle of the night. For that, I have stories of my own. There is a basement under my father's house, as large as the whole footprint of the ground floor. There is no way to access it from the house itself. For that, I would have to go out of our front door, turn right at the corner of the house, and then descend the steep concrete steps, eleven of them, to the gloomy space under our home. I hated that basement. It was dark and cold and smelled funny. Worst of all, that's where she was. An old woman who lived in that basement. No, not lived, as she wasn't a living creature. Yet she occupied that space as fully and as easily as she occupied and terrorized my childhood. The memory of her goes all the way back to my earliest recollections. She was always there, lurking, waiting. She was my first. In the beginning, it was just this unsettling presence that was concentrated at the bottom right corner of the basement. The space there appeared slightly darker compared to the rest of the room, like the light itself struggled to penetrate it all the way through. Over the next few weeks, it seems to grow bigger, spreading further into the room, claiming more of the space for itself. It felt fuller, heavier, gaining mass and a shape until I was able to see her in the corner of my eye. You all know what I'm talking about. That moment when your brain says, wait, what was that? And your eyes try to focus on the fast, blurry image that flashed by, just at the periphery of your vision. At first, my primal fear seems to satisfy her. I would sense her menacing presence and would immediately break into tears. I would call out to my mother or my father and tried to explain what I saw. I would beg them not to ask me to go down there. Nobody believed me, of course. You're just a scared child with a vivid imagination, they would say. But as I grew, so did her need for my terror. She wasn't there all the time. Sometimes there would be a month that passed by, possibly even longer just long enough for me to stop looking over my shoulder and start hoping that it was over. Maybe I imagined it all. Then the torment would start all over again, stronger than before. Few of these incidents were particularly terrifying, and even after all these years, I still remember the details with crystal clarity. One summer evening, I could not have been older than ten. I walked up the few stairs leading to my parents' front door. I opened the door and entered the long hallway that led to the living room. I remember that it was unusually bright moon that evening. I could see clearly the entire hallway, so I didn't bother to switch the light on. It has been a while since I saw her last, so she wasn't at the forefront of my mind. As I approached the living room door, the sense of dread suddenly washed over me my skin breaking into goosebumps and cold, tingly electric shock ran down my spine. I could feel her before I had a chance to see her, and as I looked up, I saw her pale face looming right above me. This was the first time that I saw her so clearly. That night, her face was permanently etched into my brain. I can see it now. Her skin had a yellowish, waxy shine to it, and her face was lined with deep creases. I could plainly see the droopy folds above and under her pale gray eyes. Her hair was shoulder length, black but heavily peppered with gray hairs. Uncombed and unruly. She was smiling. No, not smiling. More like grinning at me. Something just wasn't right about it. Her lips were thin, stretched over her gums and exposing too many teeth. The worst of all was yet to come as that wide grin stretched wider, impossibly wide, and the high-pitched scream filled my ears and my head. I run outside as fast as my ten-year-old legs would carry me. 
I remember willing them on to move as they felt wooden and so very, very heavy. I could hear my parents and their friends gathered around the barbecue at the very bottom of the garden, happily chattering away, completely oblivious to the horror I was living through at that very moment. I sprinted towards them. I almost made it, too. I was just about to round the corner of the house when she was right in front of me again with that horrible scream coming out of that wide gap on her face that shook every nerve in my body. I tripped and fell onto the sharp corner brick of the house, cutting a deep gash into my chin. By the time I reached my parents' front of my t-shirt was soaked in blood. I ended up with three stitches in my chin, and all these years later that scar is still visible and permanent reminder of her. After that, the game was on. She would come and go as she pleased. She was no longer constrained just to the basement. She was free to roam the house and torment me. The only other member of the family that would catch at least a glance of her was my grandmother. I, however, seemed to be her favorite toy. My terror fed her. My bedroom was at the far end of the house. I liked it there. The distance from the other bedrooms in the house offered a much-needed privacy from the rest of the family, as it hid my nocturnal screams and sobs to some degree. My bed was pushed against the wall, lengthwise, under the large window, the left three sides of it open. On the nights she would come, she would start pacing at the top of the bed, then down the full length of it until she finally stopped at my feet, and then back up again. Her steps would be slow and deliberate. Now and then she would pause in her pacing, and I would strain my young ears, hiding under the bed covers, trying to figure out, has she finally left me in peace for the night? More often than not, the pacing resumed shortly after with increased intensity and the taunting continued like the previous countless nights. Now and then she would yank on my hair that was protruding out from under the duvet, and I would scream and scream. My parents were at the end of their patience with my night shenanigans, as they put it. Maybe I needed professional help after all. Aren't I too old to be crying at night? I learned to bite down on the pillow and smother the screams on the nights that she was in particularly vicious and playful moods. She would keep me awake night after night, periodically pacing, whispering, or screaming in my ears. And the life went on. Two days before I left my parents' house, she made sure to send me off with a parting gift. I was 18 years old, and I haven't seen her for a long time. At least a year. I finally grew out of my imagination. Or, so I told myself. That night I went to sleep, and a few hours later, something woke me up. I sat up in bed and listened to the quiet groans and noises that old houses make. But apart from those familiar sounds, all was quiet. I laid back down, covered my head with a duvet, and was ready to go back to sleep, when suddenly, the loud scream bounced inside my head. It did not come through my ears. This horrifying scream just stuffed my brain, so fully and completely, that there was no room left for a single coherent thought. Then something pulled my hair, so hard that I felt my scalp lifting off my skull. The bed covers were yanked off me in one sleek motion. The room was icily cold. I jumped and threw myself at the direction of the light switch. But where once was an empty space between me and the wall with the light switch on, was now occupied by her. I wasn't a child anymore. I was tall enough that my eyes were on a level with hers. I saw her hooded gray eyes staring at me, the pure malice shining in them, and then I heard the familiar scream wailing out of that wide grinning mouth. I felt her bony fingers closing around my wrists squeezing harder and harder. Somehow I managed to rip myself away from her grip and hit the light switch, and her face vanished with the bright light filling the room. But I could still hear the screams. It took me a minute to realize that I was the one screaming. 
I cannot describe to you the sense of relief I had when I left my parents' home. I was tired of her, and I was tired of doubting my own sanity because of her. I never saw her again. I was away from a family home for a couple years, and when I came back, she was gone. Maybe she moved on looking for another child to terrorize, or maybe my absence starved her of pure fear she fed on, and was forced to return to the hell she crawled out of. I don't know, and I don't want to know. I was ready to write her off as a figment of an overactive, childish imagination that lingered around for way too long, until my grandmother said to me, My poor child. None of my other children see them. I thought it stopped with me, but it didn't. It just skipped a generation. Like I said at the beginning of this story, she was my first. Many, many followed. Most of them were just lost and searching for their loved ones. Some completely unaware that they are dead. Some trapped here by their own pain. Few were like her feeding off the fear of the living, but that is a story for another time. Something more important is on my mind. I have three children now, two sons and a daughter. I was hoping that it stopped with me, or maybe they were lucky and it skipped a generation. When my middle son was around six years old, roughly the same age I was when I saw her for the first time, he started waking up screaming in the night. It's just night terrors, honey, I would tell him while hugging his trembling little body close to me. It's a bad dream, that's all. Mama is here. Don't be afraid. What did you see? I saw a little boy, Mama, he said, and he asked me to swap lives with him. His life for mine. The only thing I could tell him throughout his childhood was this. Just remember... Do not look in the mirror after midnight and before three o'clock in the morning. Some call them witching hours. I don't have a name for them. I just know that's the time they look back. And once they see you... Perhaps I should start from the beginning. I was a little disgruntled when I was given an assignment in the village that's notorious for being Finland's most desolate place. Polanka. Look it up. It is certainly not the location that comes to mind when people think of Christmas. Lapland is the popular tourist destination in Finland. I was sent to Polanka with a cameraman to interview residents for a fluff piece about remote villages. I was a journalist from the sunny city of Los Angeles. The two places are worlds apart, and we were supposed to be there for a month. An entire month. Moreover, the month was December. I had to spend Christmas in the middle of nowhere. The year was 2005. I was a young woman. That's a good thing in the media industry. At first, however, it's a little rough. You have to do the stories that nobody wants to hear before you get to do the big ones. Those first few weeks in Polanka were tiresome. I was bored. My cameraman Steven was bored. The residents I interviewed were bored. We were staying at a small B&B. The couple running the establishment were actually very friendly. That's why my interview with them was so unexpectedly distressing. I've left out their names for legal reasons. It's nearly Christmas Day, I said. Are there any festivities planned? The village is so quiet. Oh, the husband said. Yeah, Christmas Day is celebrated, but it's also feared. Feared? What do you mean? I asked, smiling at what I assumed to either be a joke or the Finnish man's broken English. I think I should warn you to treat that day differently in this village. He said, Please, Heather, make sure you and Stephen are asleep before midnight on Christmas Day. Do not wake until 6 a.m. at the earliest. Why is that? 
I pressed, trembling. At this point, it was only the husband's new, sinister demeanor that gave me any cause for concern. As he spoke, his breath seemed to fill the air with an icy chill. His brown eyes, which had previously seemed so warm, were filled with a blackness that haunted me to my core. We do not stir between the hours of midnight and 6 a.m. on Christmas Day, he repeated. The wife sat there quietly. Her smile had rapidly departed her face. I wrapped up the interview, and Stephen teased me relentlessly over the next few days. What do we think? Evil Santa? Krampus? Stephen inquired, chortling. Stop it, Stephen. I scolded. I'm not scared of anything supernatural. I'm scared of him. He seemed so friendly for the first few weeks. Did you see how cold and robotic he became? Uh, they're just superstitious people, Heather. Stephen's son. We'll just have to party a little more quietly in our room when the clock strikes midnight, won't we? What? I replied, gasping. You're not going to disobey his rule. I don't want that creepy couple to come in here and hack us to pieces. Stephen smiled, wrapping his arms around me. He gave me a soft peck on the forehead. You've not gone off me, have you? He asked, affectionately booping my nose. Nope. For that to happen, I'd have to fancy you. I replied, grinning. He was an asshole, and there was no doubt about that, but Stephen did have a way of putting me at ease. Our fling didn't have any real depth, but I trusted the guy. I trusted that I was just being silly. There was nothing to fear. They were just a friendly, superstitious couple. Still that night, I saw the old man's black haunting eyes in my dreams. I wasn't fully convinced by Stephen's words. But I tried my best to move past the uncomfortable interview. The husband returned to his pleasant self over the coming days. Christmas Eve was actually surprisingly fun. The wife cooked a feast, as we were the only guests at the B&B, &B, and the four of us danced to festive music. I decided the frightening interview had been a misunderstanding. Have you had enough to eat and drink? The wife asked later in the evening. Yeah, thanks. I replied. The meal was delicious. Thank you, dear, but it is now 9pm. She said. We must all go to bed. Stephen snorted with laughter. Careful, lady. I don't know you that well. I smacked him in the arm. This is later than we usually retire on Christmas Eve. We have taken a risk to give you a pleasant evening. Now please, we must all go to sleep. The husband said curtly. I thought you said midnight. Stephen replied, swigging his drink. You must be asleep by midnight, the husband explained. I have no doubt that three hours is more than enough time to drift off, but it is better to err on the side of caution. I shot Stephen a look. He knew my looks well. Okay, Stephen drunkenly slurred, raising his hands. You're the man, man. He giggled obnoxiously as we climbed the stairs to bed and I apologized profusely to the couple, but they shrugged it off. They understood that Stephen was simply a little too inebriated. I felt guilty for previously being so creeped out by the husband. He had returned to his friendly self. In hindsight, I realized he was probably just relieved that we were going to bed early. Don't be so sour. Stephen chuckled, hugging me from behind. I pushed him off, clambering into bed. Wait, you're not seriously going to sleep, are you? Stephen laughed, looking at his watch. It's 9.14pm, Heather. I'm respecting their one rule. I replied, tucking myself under the duvet. Suit yourself, Stephen shrugged. I'll just watch TV on the lowest volume and keep drinking. Please get in bed. I requested. I'm sure I'll pass out before midnight. He chuckled. 
Don't worry. I won't get us into any trouble with the spooky owners. I don't remember falling asleep. What I do remember is waking up. That, in fact, is something I cannot forget. I opened my eyes. There was some sort of commotion outside the window. I checked the alarm clock on my bedside table. 4.07 AM. I had woken up too early. I had a vision of the terrifying old man. I pictured him charging into our room and butchering us in bed for disobeying his rule. Steven? I whispered into the darkness. He wasn't in bed. He wasn't in the armchair in front of the small TV. He wasn't anywhere in the room. I heard footsteps outside. Snow was crunching beneath feet. There was a muffled voice. It sounded like screaming. I scrambled out of bed and ran to the window, tearing the curtains open, and saw something that still haunts my very waking and sleeping hour. Wading through the snow, an eight-foot-tall abomination left a trail from the front door of the B&B. &B. It was a hulking figure, unlike any earthly creature I'd ever seen. Its skin was black. I still don't know whether I was more horrified by this monstrosity or the half-alive body of the cameraman that it was dragging through the snow. Stephen would have been able to see me standing in the window, but his eyelids appeared to be sewn shut. I realized his mouth was also sewn shut, which explained the muffled screams. He was missing all four of his limbs, but there was not a spot of blood on him. It seemed his limbless torso also had its wounds neatly stitched up. The only mess he left behind was a yellow trail of urine. I clasped my hand to my mouth, futilely attempting to mute the sound of my tortured wail. It was no use. The creature stopped walking. Unclenching its right claw, the being dropped Stephen's near-lifeless body into the snow. The demonic creature slowly turned around to look at the window. Perhaps it had not even heard me. Perhaps it had just sensed that, like Stephen, I was not in bed. I had broken the rule. The being's face was crimson red and floated in the center of its pitch black head. The thing had no eyes, but I know it saw everything. It somehow sensed I was awake. The creature's mouth was stretched into a wide, toothy grin that curved from one side of its face to the other. I unleashed a primal scream into the sweaty palm of my hand. My eyes swilled with tears as I stared into the featureless face of the thing I was sure would kill me. The being started to walk back towards the bed and breakfast. I leapt away from the curtains, tripping backwards over the bed. I needed to fall asleep but I only had seconds to do so. Even if I hadn't been in a state of sheer panic, it would have been near impossible to achieve that. Suddenly, I had an idea. It was a bad idea, but it was the only option. I knew how to make sure I wouldn't be awake when the creature reached my room. I had to knock myself out. I could have held my breath, but that would have taken too long. I heard the front door of the building open and close. There were heavy footsteps on the creaky floorboards of the downstairs hallway. I did a dangerous thing. Obviously, it's not something I'd advise anyone else to do. I could hear the stairs creaking. The creature was getting closer. My heart was pounding. I hoped I would pass out from fear. I backed away from the window to get a running start. Then I sprinted towards it. At the last second, I lunged for the windowsill, ensuring that my head made contact with its sharp corner. When I woke, it was morning. It worked. My crazy plan worked. I was alive. I had an obscenely large lump on the side of my head, but I was alive. The bump didn't kill me, and the creature didn't kill me. I thought for a fleeting moment that the whole thing might have been a dream, but when I clambered to my feet, I received a horrifying confirmation of what had transpired during the early hours of the morning. 
There was a trail through the snow. It was the width of a human body. It led far from the village and vanished beyond the visible horizon. Stephen was gone. Merry Christmas. The somber voice came from behind me. I turned to face the old man who was standing in my open doorway. It was so many years ago, but I don't remember opening the door. Perhaps the creature entered my room. Perhaps it checked that I was not awake. I bought a bus ticket to Helsinki Airport. The old man said, just one. I didn't say a word to that old couple. I left Stephen's things behind. I told our company that he went missing. There were search parties, police investigations, and so on. He was never found. Seventeen years later, I don't travel. I know I'm far away from there, but I still dream of that horrendous, red-faced creature. I fear Christmas, just as the old man did. I live in Los Angeles, but I still don't stay up past midnight on Christmas Day. Twenty seventeen was the last year my family went on our yearly ski trip. It was a family tradition, and one of the few times I'd see some of my siblings, as most of them are all much older than me and have lives of their own. I remember my mom suggesting we'd stay at an Airbnb last year, as it was cheaper and not far from the ski hill. And we all thought that was a great idea, so my mom, my dad, my younger brother Jackson and I piled into the car to meet my older brother Isaac, and my older sister Megan, and her husband Drew. I was excited to see them. Jackson and I jumped out of the car the second we arrived, eagerly looking forward to picking our shared room. Race ya! Jackson screamed while barreling ahead of me. Hey, no fair! I laughed, chasing him, but just barely keeping up. He pointed to a room on the top floor and motioned for me to follow him to it. I followed him to the room. It was amazing. It had a big loft with our beds on it and a huge TV. There was a giant window on the loft level. This place is awesome. Jackson shouted while climbing up the ladder to the loft. I followed and peered out the window into the enchanting winter forest just behind the cabin. I had the feeling this trip was going to be amazing. I was wrong. A few hours after we arrived, my 18-year-old brother Isaac came. He marveled at the cabin's beauty and charm, and so did Megan and Drew when they arrived. The first few days were great. We all drove to the ski hill together. My dad would take us boys skiing while well, my mom and sister relaxed in the lodge, since my sister was pregnant with my first nephew at the time. It was on the third night that something strange began to happen. I woke up at around two in the morning to the sound of sticks or something being thrown at the huge window in Jackson and I's room. I sat awake and listened for a few moments while staring at the window. Even though there was a thin curtain covering the window, the light from the moon allowed me to watch the silhouettes of the sticks hitting the window. They weren't big, they were thin and small, but big enough to make a distinct tapping noise every time they hit. Tap, tap, tap. Dylan? Jackson called tiredly. Stop with that noise. It's not me. Look. I whisper shouted to him while pointing to the window. Now he was watching the sticks hit the window. What is that? He whispered. Let's find out. I whispered while creeping out of bed. I turned back to see if Jackson was following me. He hesitated, but curiosity overcame him and he crept after me. I rolled the curtains up and gazed down into the darkness. I couldn't see anything despite the big, bright moon. Just a stick being tossed from the darkness below and hitting the window every few seconds. Jackson and I opened the window. The stick tossing seized. Hello? 
Jackson called. For a few moments it was quiet. But then someone responded. Hey Jackson! Hey Dylan! The voice called. I recognized it immediately. It was Drew. Drew has a very thick Australian accent, as he lived there most his life, so it wasn't hard to conclude it was just Drew pranking us. Funny prank, Drew. Jackson said playfully. Then he closed the window and climbed back into bed. Isn't that kind of weird? I asked Jackson. Eh, he's just playing around. Jackson replied nonchalantly. I agreed and went back to Ben. The next day was normal. Drew didn't mention anything about the prank, but it was in the back of my mind now. However, that night, I was awoken again by the same tapping on the window. At the same time as the night before, I immediately looked over at Jackson. We both got up and opened the window. Again. All I saw was darkness, but this time I could hear Drew giggling. Hey, Drew. I said, a bit aggravated. Guys, Drew said between giggles, come out here. Jackson and I exchanged glances. We can't. Mom and Dad will get mad. Drew's giggling stopped. His tone got urgent and serious quickly. You gotta see this. Come down here. No, I said. Come down here. Drew screamed angrily. A rock flew from the darkness. It just barely hit me. It fell through the window onto the floor. Jackson and I looked at each other in fear. Normally, Drew was a polite and calm guy. He's always been kind and loving towards Jackson and I. He never raised his voice. He never took things too far. I knew him as a voice of reason, and he had become even calmer after learning he was going to have a baby. I'm getting Megan. Jackson cried. He rushed away. Drew's screams grew louder and more aggressive. Get out here now! Drew screamed louder than ever. I fell to my knees and balled up on the floor in terror while tears flowed out my eyes. That's when I heard Jackson come running into the room with Megan. Dylan, come down here now! Megan called from below the loft. Quickly, I went down the ladder and ran into my sister's arms. Drew was still screaming from outside. I had my eyes closed while my sister hugged me. When I opened them, I realized the terrifying truth. Drew was standing right there. But who was currently standing outside our cabin screaming then? The person was still screaming for Jackson and I. Thoughts swarmed my mind. Who was out there? How did it know my name? And why did it sound just like Drew? We all stood in fearful silence. The voice stopped. But then a huge, jagged rock, as big as my head, flew through the window. Of the loft, and straight at my sister. Her real husband pulled her back quickly. She still screamed at the top of her lungs, which made my parents and Isaac rush into the room. They comforted my sister, and that's when I noticed this humanoid thing climbing through this still open window. I screamed while everyone else began noticing it. That's when we all booked it to the car. Everyone piled in my parents' car and we left the other cars behind. My mom was on the phone with the police for a lot of the drive. They searched the whole house and woods outside the house, to no avail. It's been years since that happened. The baby my sister was pregnant with is in school now, but I still wake up in a cold sweat at night, thinking I heard a voice call me and tell me, Dylan, come out here. This happened to me about two years ago, around late December of 2020. I was 19 around the time. Me and my girlfriend were at my grandparents' place having a couple drinks out in the garage until it got too cold to stay out there. It was one of the coldest nights of the year and there was a bad blizzard that night. 
We live in Canada, by the way. We both went back to the house around 2 a.m. She went into my room, and I went out in the kitchen to cook something for us in the oven. I was on my phone standing alone out in the kitchen when my grandma and my girlfriend both walked out the kitchen together. It was a bit strange because my grandma is never up that late, and it was even stranger that my girlfriend came out at the same time. The first thing my grandma said to me is, don't go back out there tonight. On a night like this, people lose their lives. I was a little bit freaked out because I was just about to head back out to the garage to grab something. I never told anyone I was going back out. My girlfriend and my grandma just stood there staring at me with the weirdest expressions I've ever seen. With very unnatural smiles that didn't seem right. My girlfriend then walked over and gave me a hug. When I grabbed her, she was ice cold. I commented about this, and when I mentioned how cold she was, her expression changed. Her smile faded, and she looked up at me with really serious, sad eyes and didn't say anything. There was something else I noticed too. She smelled like a campfire, an earthy, smoky smell. There wasn't an explanation for this, and she didn't smell like that earlier. I swear at that moment, I got chills all over. There was something so off about it all, but I couldn't put my finger on it. My girlfriend whispered in my ear, Don't go outside tonight. She walked back over to my grandma. She stood beside her with her head down and a serious expression while my grandma was still staring at me with that weird, fake smile. It was so bizarre, I just stood there speechless. The wind began to literally howl outside. My grandma turned and looked at my girlfriend. Don't mess with black magic, she said. Nothing good is going to come from it. My girlfriend didn't say anything. She continued looking down. I stood there confused. My girlfriend looked up at me. We have to go now, she said. They both started walking away. My grandma looked back at me for a second. See you on the flip side, she said with that weird smile. I got another chill through my whole body when she said that. They turned the corner and left the kitchen. I stood there for a while. I didn't know what to make of it all. I decided not to go out to the garage. I'd go out and get my stuff the next morning. I stayed out in the kitchen for another 10 minutes until the food was done. I went back into my room with it. My girlfriend was in bed laying down. She got up and we put on a movie. I guess I was quiet because she asked me what's wrong. I told her everything was okay. It took me 10 minutes to say something about it because, to be honest, I was still frightened by it. I turned to her and asked her why... She and my grandma came out to the kitchen. The second I said that, my nose started bleeding. I ran to the bathroom and got something to stop the bleeding. When I went back in the room, I told my girlfriend everything. As you can guess, she said she never went out into the kitchen. And she swore on someone's life she was in the room the whole time. She also didn't smell like smoke anymore. We went and woke up my grandma right after, and my grandma said the same thing. She actually thought we were trying to mess with her, and she didn't believe me. We were so freaked out after this, we had trouble sleeping for the rest of the night. The part that really messed my girlfriend up was when I told her about how cold she felt, and how she smelled like smoke. The only explanation we could come up with was that maybe if I went outside that night, Something bad would have happened to me. Maybe the spirits of dead relatives watching over me came to me in that form so I wouldn't be scared, and they could get the message through. The last part of it that made sense was the part about the black magic. My girlfriend just got a book about witchcraft from her friend the week prior. My girlfriend never opened the book again after this. She took what was said as a warning. I've been thinking about writing this story down for the past two years, and my girlfriend encouraged me to finally do it, 
because maybe someone else out there had an experience like this. To this day, I still get chills thinking about it, especially the last thing said. See you on the flip side. Hey Noah, can you draw us? My friend Joey practically begged me on his hands and knees, pulling his girlfriend close to him. Cindy nodded in agreement with her boyfriend's request. I raised an eyebrow, chuckling to myself. You do realize you'll have to stand still for a while. I can only really draw still life stuff. They both shrugged it off, already sitting in a position they could hold for a while. I grabbed my sketchbook and got to drawing. It didn't take me long to sketch out their forms, followed by the details that would make each of them unique. The freckles across Cindy's mouth, the muscles along Joey's arms, the way her hair sort of swirled like a tornado. As I leant back to take a peek at the finished product, I realized I had accidentally drawn Joey's hand on Cindy's shoulder. Or at least I thought it was Joey's. They were not even remotely similar. Unlike Joey's broad and large hands, the fingers on Cindy's shoulder were wrinkled, devoid of any moisture. Long, rotting nails jutted out like bones from the tip of its fingers, digging into Cindy's hot pink blouse. I looked over at her, but there was no hand to be there. Just as I went to erase the decrepit limb, Joey took the book out of my hand. Cindy looked delighted, clasping her hands together. However, as her eyes traced the drawing, she must have hovered over the rotting hand because her face fell. She pointed at it, causing Joey's expression to drop with hers. After a moment, his face lit up with laughter. Oh man, that actually freaked me out for a moment. You're such an artist. He squeezed her shoulders, smiling at me. Thanks, Noah. Cindy thanked me half-heartedly, not so psyched about the weird hand. As I tore the paper out of the sketchbook and handed it to them, I couldn't help but wonder why I drew that. I don't recall doing so, not consciously at least. In all likelihood, I did it because I saw someone hold something and that image stuck with me. I wasn't sure why the hand looked so twisted, but I wasn't going to question the coincidence. It was just one of those weird moments, nothing more. Still, I couldn't get the hand out of my head. On the bus back home from school, I pulled out my sketchbook and began doodling the girl sitting in front of me. I wasn't the type to do this, but I needed to see if what happened was just a one-time occurrence. The drawing started off fine. She was wearing a dark coat and was staring at the phone in her hand, brown hair draping over her face. That should have been all there was, but my hand continued to move. I began drawing another figure. This one far more inhumane, with decomposing skin, gnarly bones protruding from underneath. Slowly its form became more apparent. Though humanoid, it was obviously anything but human. It was perched on the shoulders of a girl. Head tilted with curiosities, it watched whatever the girl's phone was playing. Where eyes should have been were instead replaced by hollow sockets, flies entering and exiting, its mouth agape and forever held in an expression of shock, seemed to sag, the skin connecting the jaw and the skull teetering on the edge of ripping apart. Despite the fact I couldn't see it, I was able to draw the thing with extreme detail, each pore, each blemish, every wrinkle, each hair. Everything about it was etched into the paper with perfect accuracy. Frantic, I flipped a page and drew the girl yet again, this time in far less detail. I realized that the constant scratching of lead on paper was disturbing the other passengers, but I couldn't stop. Once the silhouette of the girl was finished, my hands yet again moved on their own, muscle memory guiding each careful stroke. The creature was yet again seated on the girl's shoulders, 
only now it wasn't looking at the girl's phone. It was looking at me. One final time, I flipped the page and scribbled an incoherent mess that barely resembled the girl. But the feeling of needing to continue the drawing seized. The thing moved. In that instant, I hopped off at the next stop and dashed for my home, cradling the sketchbook to my chest. I frantically looked around, drawing the scenery in the hope that I'll be able to find that thing again. Each time I did, it would be there either waiting for me with a curious tilted head or running along the roofs on all fours, still glaring right at me. Eventually, I reached my house. Once I spun around and locked the doors behind me, I made a quick sketch of the door. To my horror, the urge to continue drawing once I finished continued, and the ghastly expression was printed behind the window. Somehow, despite the fact it had no eyes, I knew that it was making eye contact. Scared beyond belief, I ran to my room, barricading it with my bed and dresser. Then, huddled in the corner of the opposite side of the door, I began filling the pages with drawing after drawing of the entrance. At first, there was nothing special in the first 30 or so pages. But then came those nails. Those long, black talons that held the bottom of the door trying to pry it open. It tried and tried, each drawing showing the thing's hands in a different position. I thought it would give up, but I'm on my third sketchbook now, and it still hasn't let up. I'm writing this now to give my sore hands a break. It's beginning to wear the door down. Nail marks cover the outer frame. Splinters of wood are sticking out and the paint itself has begun peeling away. Calling the police isn't an option, and the room doesn't have any windows. I can't leave. I don't know why I'm even bothering to post this. I guess it's some sort of last wish. I know this probably comes off as some sort of rant, but it's not. There are things that don't live in our realm of existence. Maybe it was my fault for being so curious. Putting my nose into places where it shouldn't go, but I couldn't help myself. If you ever find the need to draw something that you can't see or feel, ignore it. Keep your distance. Put your pencil down. Just for the love of God, don't let it know you can see it. Because it can see you. It was around seven months ago when I first made my report to the higher-ups, many of whom immediately assumed I was lying. Some suggested it was for the sake of garnering attention, and others suggested that I was attempting to cause a panic within the community. Many had come to label me as a shit-stirrer, but one of the higher-ups, Gary, a man who I had collaborated with previous projects, was the only one who had bothered to investigate the issue. And only because it's you, he said. The meeting took place soon after. The television droned softly with the sound of static. The dim, grainy screen cast an odd, whirring incandescent across the room that sketched thick. Black shadows across the textured walls. The strange lighting created the impression of thick silhouettes that pulsed deeply within all the odd little crevices of the room. Gary sat motionless for 16 minutes before his eyes began to flicker. Gary? I said. Are you in? There was silence for a moment. Yeah. He said lowly. I'm in. Sure enough, there was that odd, disjointed quality to his voice that I had found myself looking for. Over the years, I had come to recognize this as a subtle, but sure sign of success that strange, almost asynchronous manner of response. I knew that Gary was in. I barely needed to probe his answer for semantics, but for that feeling of discontent. His body was here, but his mind had accessed a different plane. Good, good, stick around, I told him. 
I'll be joining you in a few minutes. There was a brief pause before Gary responded. Alright, I'll just float around, he said flatly. I sat up and shut off the television. Gary's technique involved the use of constant droning frequencies, hence the static. Mine did not. I lay back, closed my eyes, and began my own ritual, which many in the community know as the dimensions of visualization. This ritual involves visualizing each of the three core components of what one perceives to be the self, the unconscious, corporeal body, the nebulous, one slowly stretching out, materializing above its physical counterpart, and the soul chain which binds them both. When I had finished rendering that image of the trilogy, I focused my energies on the next stage of the process. I concentrated deeply on the body which occupied the material world, imagined it rising slowly and in one motion. I hurled my consciousness into the immaterial body. I had done it. I gave myself a moment to adjust to the odd sensations. It had been remarkably fast. My vision cleared and I was greeted to the familiar image of the dark little room, with Gary floating above his material body in the same nebulous from as I, his spectral form giving off a faint glow. That certainly didn't take you long. You're bound to have broken some sort of record there. I suppose that's what happens when you've been practicing as long as I have. I said, smiling. It was odd, though. Gary noting how quickly I had done it. Gary, while not as talented in projecting as some of the other higher-ups, had proven to be an excellent coordinator. He had links across the world and had documented various findings, and conducted many studies into astral projection, or remote viewing, as he often insisted on calling it. He was something of an authority figure in a small but fast-growing community. I suppose that's why I had drove two hours to meet him in the first place. Well, I suppose we'll get on with it. And Gary mumbled something of a low agreement. Gary and I stood abreast, gathering our minds, respective energies, letting them splay out against each other and warp to form a sort of bubble, a type of mental cocoon that would link us, keep us together throughout the voyage. So then, the moon was it? There was a low, incredulous note to Gary's question. I've never been there myself. Though, you know I'm not one for space travel. Yeah, try to focus on your form now. And lean and secure its energy into my own. I'll take it from there. When Gary had anchored his energy to my own, I began to cast my thoughts to the moon. It was never easy to shift your mind from one place to another, especially over such a great distance. But I had done it before. I visualized the pallor of the alien landscape, and the light outside the cocoon slowly began to warp, as if being stretched and swirled like some sort of cosmic tie-dye, and with a sudden, increased tightening of the light, the shift occurred. The light outside the cocoon began to unfold itself, sharpening into a perceptible image of a vast, ivory landscape pressing harshly against a black, star-specked void. Follow me. I'll take you to the site of incident. Gary and I began to walk, still encapsulated in our bubble. So, this is the moon, Gary's son. No giant soul arm. Giant soul arm? Yeah, there was a rumor going around a few years back about there being some sort of odd artificial construction on the moon. A giant mechanical arm that would pick up any cosmic travelers, such as ourselves, and throw them back to their bodies on Earth. They said that the U.S. government set it up when they got here in 1969, probably to stop us from seeing something they were trying to keep wrapped up. I suppose the rumor was hard to believe, considering we've only really had verified claims of space travel in the last decade or so. The moon seems to have a lot of weird rumors surrounding it. 
That's probably the reason the council was skeptical of my report. Probably. We continued our walk for what may have been 60 minutes. The stars were bright, and the light that reflected from the lunar surface would have blinded us. Would have seared our retinas had we been in a physical sense. The light was processed not physically, but mentally, through different wavelengths of observation than that of raw biological photosensitivity. I remember feeling unsettled, yet inspired. Mankind had conquered all manner of climates on Earth, and now we had conquered even the imposing sterility of this vast satellite. We soon crested the rim of a large crater, the site of incident, and Gary saw firsthand the strange activity I had described in my report. In the hundreds, or even thousands, tall, shadowy beings stood within the depths of the hollow. Each of the beings' long, wispy limbs seemed to undulate, constrict, and dilate in haphazard rhythms. The pigmentation in their bodies took on hues of gray and black. The coloration, alongside that unnatural jittery motion of the limbs, gave the impression of TV static. Astral beings. But why so many? That's what I hoped you could tell me. Gary took a moment to watch the odd gathering of entities. He seemed visibly unsettled. The council seems to reckon there's about 28 types or species. Gary paused again, looking into the crater, analyzing the curious forms of each of the beings. But this type doesn't look familiar at all. And across all the documented types, there have never been gatherings of this size. I looked at the huge gathering down in the crater. A small number of the beings appeared to be looking in our direction, but the strange contractions of their bodies made it hard to tell. Gary, I don't say this to cause any further panic, but to me, it looks like there are more of them now than there was when I first made the incident report. Strange. Have you tried communicating with them? No. I think we should try. If they don't seem like the talkative sort, worst case scenario is we've wasted another 10 minutes climbing down there. We stepped down the edge of the crater at a steep angle, but it was no trouble for us. After all, gravity did not affect us in this state. We could have hovered down if we wanted. As we continued to descend the crater, I felt gripped by the sense of a dread that seemed to grow in intensity as we got lower down. The deepest recesses of the crater were shrouded in a strange, impenetrable blackness. It was like a weeping sore, one that oozed thick black pus. It didn't seem right that such thick shadow could gather in the harsh sunlight, but I pushed those thoughts down, ignoring them. We continued our descent. Not far away from our path, one of the beings stood away from the others, facing into the dark hollow. Gary commented on the odd sense of dread that the gathering seemed to evoke. Because of this, we decided that this lone entity would be ideal, and perhaps safer, for making contact. Gary also suggested that only one of us should approach it, it might see the both of us sauntering up to it as aggressive, and then we'll definitely not get anything out of it, he said. As for the matter of who would make contact, we agreed on a game of rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors. My hand splayed out flat, met with Gary's bald fist, and covered it. Gary sighed. All right, I won't be a minute. Stick around here. All right, I said. I broke down the bubble which secured us together and he began to steady plod toward the creature. Soon after, I was able to pick up on the low sound of Gary projecting his thoughts in the being's direction. Not in English, but a language of pure thought. One that the dark entity would have a better chance of understanding. He sent out a greeting in the being's direction. It did not exchange the greeting, it simply responded by turning and facing him. 
The two stood still for a moment, simply looking at each other. Gary sent out another greeting. That's when I noticed that the rhythm of contractions in the astral being's body started to grow in rapidity. The wispy limbs flared in a manner that appeared aggressive. The being's shadowy, poorly defined face wrenched backward in a motion that looked painful. Great rips started to form. The crevices in the creature's head grew longer and wider. As they expanded, they ran into each other, becoming a singular large tear across the creature's head. This created the impression of a mouth, one that was shredded and mangled. That was when the screaming started. Gary stood motionless, as if completely stunned. The astral being continued to emit deep, garbled waves that made me feel disoriented. Even from where I stood? Gary, come on. We have to go. I called out, all the while trying to maintain my composure. But Gary wouldn't move and the crowd of beings toward the bottom of the crater had taken notice of me. They began to shamble in my direction, and as they got closer, the feeling of disorientation only intensified. Their bodies pulsed with the same aggressive rapidity that the screamers did. Things were getting dangerous, and panic set in. I knew that my heart would be beating dangerously fast back on Earth. I tried to return to my body so that I could wake Gary up and bring him back, but something was wrong. I couldn't go back. The cause became apparent. It was that distorted cry that the creatures emitted. Those horrible sounds seemed to shake the connection between the physical and metaphysical body. They seemed to corrode the soul chain itself. Without even thinking, I ran and ran and ran. Luckily, the beings didn't move very fast and seemed to give up on their chase once I had ascended the crater's edge. I had managed to escape. When I had got far away enough from the crater, I found that I was able to return to my body, no longer discombobulated by the crazed screaming. I jolted upright as my consciousness returned to my body. I took long, deep breaths as my mind raced with thoughts of the screamers their horrible wailing, and that impossibly dark mass of shadows at the crater's lowest point. And another thought. Gary. I turned, grabbed him by the shoulders, and shook him hard. I kept shaking. He was breathing and his pulse remained steady, but he didn't respond. I kept on shaking and shaking. No response. A few days later, I sent my final report to the council. Simon, another of the higher-ups, treated the matter with a degree of seriousness on account of Gary's disappearance. I made my terms clear. I wouldn't bring Simon to the moon. I wouldn't be going back to that damn satellite. And I certainly wouldn't be going anywhere near the infested crater. Simon smiled. Not to worry. I'll be able to make the journey myself. You did well supplying the information. Simon's form took on a myriad of brilliant hues as the light bent and folded around him. A second later, he was gone. I don't participate in the community much nowadays, but to my knowledge, he hasn't been seen since. I rarely astral project nowadays, and when I do, I never leave the planet. Instead, I travel to the hospital where Gary now lives if such a grim state of survival can be considered living. Permanently lying in a comatose state. I can't bring myself to go in person. His family visit him regularly. I see them often. Although the visits have been getting less frequent as the months keep rolling by, if you are a practitioner of astral projection or remote viewing, I urge that you heed this warning. Stay away from the moon. When you think, there's probably this quiet voice in your head that you recognize as your own. That's what other people have told me, at least. Mine works a little differently. 
It's really interesting when you think about it. You go through life assuming something is normal, because nobody really talks about it. Like, who taught you how to take a shower? Nobody, right? What if the way you do it is just wrong compared to the way everybody else does it? You might never know. How often do you watch other people shower? Never mind. Don't answer that. The problem I have is that I learned at 27 years old that not everyone's inner voice screams at them from across the room. Not everyone's inner voice constantly eggs them on to do horrible things. I've heard of intrusive thoughts. I just have a lot of them compared to other people. And they are so, so loud. It's also really interesting how the mind tunes certain things out after a while. Or just classifies them as normal. You'd think hearing a madman with a voice that sounds like mine, but just a little bit off, scream at me from the next room would scare me, but after dealing with it every day, I've just sort of... gotten used to it. I can't afford therapy. Hell, up until a few weeks ago, I didn't even know it was abnormal. The screaming part doesn't scare me. It's when my inner voice gets real quiet. That really scares me. Like it's plotting. My own mind working against me. Get up. My eyes shot open, transitioning from a deep sleep to instantly being fully alert in my bed. I glanced over at my clock. 4.34 a.m. I was preparing to roll over and go back to sleep, brushing it off as me hearing things when the sound of a single footstep echoed throughout my apartment. The sound we all dread to hear late at night. Someone else was in here. Reach into your nightstand. My own voice said, seemingly from across the room. I squinted my eyes in confusion. I've never used my nightstand for anything. There's nothing in it. Do it quickly. They're coming. The voice was so quiet as though it were afraid the intruder might hear it that tiny hint of offness lingering in it. My words, just a little bit wrong. I sat up in bed and reached towards my nightstand to pull open the drawer, except nothing. It was too dark to see into it, so I reached in and felt around. My hand immediately rubbed against something hard and cold. How did you... I whispered. Pointed at the door, the voice said. It felt closer now, as though it were coming from a man sitting on the edge of my bed. Am I crazy? Would I know if I was? Would someone tell me? Would I even listen to them? Another footstep just outside of my bedroom door now. I moved my hand and angled my strangely familiar feeling weapon towards the door. I heard the doorknob jiggle. The silence was instantly broken by the sound of a single gunshot, followed by my door swinging open and a body falling to the ground in my bedroom with a thud. I jumped to my feet. My hands were shaking and it felt like I wasn't fully in control of myself. Like I'd done this before. I rushed over and flicked on the light, keeping my weapon pointed at the intruder. He was on his stomach, with a hole through his back. Please. He whimpered. Thank God, he's alive. I might be defending my home, but I didn't want to kill someone if I didn't absolutely have to. I kicked him over so he was laying on his back. He looked right at me, and his face went from sad and wilted to horrified in an instant. No. No, what? What are you? He said. Maybe he hit his head on the way down. Had he not even realized he'd been shot. Then he started screaming. Oh god, the screaming. Like he was eye to eye with the devil. Suddenly I spotted movement in my peripheral vision. I swung my gun to the right, only to discover myself face to face with my standing bedroom mirror. That's when I understood that something was seriously wrong. What I saw was myself. Exactly as I was, but instead of looking at the mirror, I was still looking down at the man gun pointed at him. 
It was shocking to say the least. Like a still image taken from 10 seconds ago. It shocked me even more when the me in the mirror turned to look at the real me. They will never believe you. He said before turning the gun on himself and firing. I woke up in the hospital a day later. Police reports said that I was defending my home from a home invader when I succumbed to what they believed was a seizure induced by extreme stress and passed out hitting my head on my bed frame on the way down. According to the report, I had shot that man nine times. It was ruled self-defense and I never needed to go to trial. One perk of living in a deep red state, I guess. Since that day, the voice disappeared. I finally have what I consider to be normal thoughts. I got a better job and see a therapist three times a month. Life is getting better. But every once in a while out of the corner of my eye, I'll catch my reflection. It could be anything. A freshly waxed car, a mirror, a black computer screen, and usually it'll be fine. Just me doing whatever it is I'm doing. But sometimes the reflection feels... different. Sometimes it seems just a little bit... wrong. I'm a student at a university in the UK, and have been for two years now. Last year and this year, I have been living in student halls which for anyone who isn't familiar with the term, is student accommodation. During my first year I was on the second floor of the block of flats I was living in, and never experienced anything weird. Nothing out of the ordinary, nothing that freaked me out. However. Now in my second year, I'm in a different block of flats and this time I'm on the third floor. The highest floor in the block with only another floor above for storage rooms. No one lived up there which is important to note. The only people that go up to the fourth floor are maintenance and cleaning during the hours of 7am and 5pm. When me and my friends first moved into this flat, we noticed that we could hear weird noises above at night when we were going to bed. Sounds like chairs being scraped across the floor, or just furniture in general being moved as well as what sounded like people running up and down the corridor. Loud and heavy steps. Didn't think much of it at first as we didn't actually realize the fourth floor didn't have people above us. Before I get into the details properly, a little timeline is that we moved in September 2022. Started hearing noises a couple of weeks after we moved in, and then it was the middle of October, so quite a few weeks later, that I was woken up in the middle of the night, 2.45 to 3 a.m., to what I can only describe as the sound of something large, with a bit of weight to it being thrown across the floor above me. It startled me as it jumped me awake. That's the first time I felt a bit creeped out by it, as I wondered what on earth people were doing in the flat above us at that time. Not only had it woken me up that night, but it had woken my friend up too, who had come through to ask if anyone had heard the noise. The next day, we contacted our head resident of the block and asked if she would have a word with the people above us to keep the noise down during the night as we like to have a good time as much as anyone, but not at 3 in the morning, especially when we have full days of classes the next day. This was when she informed us that there wasn't actually anyone in the flats above us, and that it was all storage rooms and a cleaning cupboard. This information clearly freaked us out as the noises we were hearing obviously shouldn't be coming from a storage cupboard. From this point, we didn't really know what to do, so we just had to kind of get on with it. By weird coincidence, the next week we required maintenance to come out and have a look at our fridge, which had stopped working, and we asked him if they happened to go to the storage in the middle of the night, or security, as we had been hearing noises in the middle of the night, but they were adamant that no one was going up there past 5 to 5.30 at night. 
but he was happy to go up and have a look to see if there was a trapped bird or something, which would be making all the noise. Thirty minutes later, he reported back that there was nothing but one of the big storage shelves had collapsed, so that could have been what we heard. We got some comfort from that and moved on. After that, we didn't hear the noise for a while, until the middle of November when it started back up again. This time, it was more obnoxious. Things being thrown, scraping, running, banging on things, dropping heavy objects on the floor so it sounded like a person was about to fall through our ceiling. It was more annoying than creepy at this point. We then decided that going up to the fourth floor to see for ourselves would be a beneficial option. We got up there, and it looked just the same as our floor, except there was just locked doors. We couldn't get into any of them, and that was that. There was nothing there that could have answered any of our questions, so we got back into the lift to go back down to our floor, but as we were leaving it, we heard a sound coming from one of the locked rooms. It was like a scratching noise when your dog is scratching the door to get out, or dragging your nails down a hard surface. We stopped to listen, but the scratching got harsher, so we took our leave. We have seen horror movies, and we aren't stupid. We reported the noises to the accommodation staff, and they checked it out. Came back with nothing once again. We came to the conclusion after that we weren't going to get answers, so we left it once again and just had to deal with the noises we were hearing. Now we are at the start of December, and it's getting worse, which is why I've come here. The noises have gotten worse, but me, as well as all my friends, have admitted to hearing scratching noises coming from our hallway in the middle of the night. We all lock the doors at night, so it would be impossible for anyone to be getting in the flat. At first we thought one of us was just winding each other up and trying to freak us out, but... After we have all admitted to hearing the noise, we have now realized that it isn't one of us. A couple of days ago, we all stayed up in my room to see if we could hear the noise and prove it wasn't one of us making the noise, and sure enough, around 2 to 3 a.m. we heard the scratching. At first, it was distant, like it was at the front door, and then got louder as if someone was dragging their nails along the wall, and it stopped right outside of my room. It's safe to say we were all freaked out, and called security who came up and found nothing except me and my friends clutching each other. It happens every night now, and we don't know what to do. We don't know what it is, and clearly no one else is experiencing this either. We are desperate for some advice to what's going on, and although none of us are saying it, but if whatever is doing this can make its way into our locked and secure flat, then surely it will be able to make its way into our locked and secure bedrooms, too. Any advice would be helpful. I live in a rural farming community. Almost everything is surrounded by large cornfields. Now, I've heard my fair share of rumors and myths regarding the fields but I'm not particularly superstitious. Or at least, I wasn't. I was driving back home after taking my daughter, Salem, to a doctor's appointment. She's only four months old, so we still have to go to checkups for her. It's the time of year when the corn stalks are taller than my car. When it's lights out, I do really enjoy the drive. It's calming and beautiful. It was dark out though, and the stalks looked like they were reaching for my car. There's kind of a rule here that when it's dark out, you shouldn't look into the corn. I don't know why that's a rule, but I followed it to a T that night. My stomach was in knots as I kept my eyes firmly on the road ahead of me. Salem began crying. That's normal for her. She's a fussy baby, and she is not a big fan of the car. I dug through her bag in the seat next to me for her favorite toy, a little stuffed mothman that my sister got her for a joke. With a name like Salem, she regularly gets stuff like that. I reached back to drop the toy into her car seat. 
As I did so, my head turned towards the fields. For just a split second, I saw eyes. I immediately turned my attention back to the road. My heart was pounding, but I was trying to be rational. The eyes had flashed, like a cat, but entirely too big. I swallowed down my fear. I was being rational. It was definitely a cat and nothing more. Salem stopped crying. She actually started laughing. No one has ever made her laugh before. Neither me, nor her mother. I looked in the rear view mirror and found those eyes looking back at me again. There's a second part to that rule. If you do look into the corn, don't look in the back seat. I ignored that rule. My daughter was in danger. It didn't matter that she was laughing. Even poison can look like precious fruit sometimes. I slammed on the brakes and whipped around. There was nothing there. Salem went back to her forlorn crying. I breathed a sigh of relief, then looked around. There was nothing. I continued on down the road. Salem's little screams were a blessing. It meant she was safe. I glanced up into the rearview mirror to check on her. There were those eyes. I had no time to react before calloused, long fingers were around my neck. I blacked out. When I awoke, it was bright out. I was still in the car, in a ditch on the side of the road. Police and ambulance surrounded the vehicle. My ears were ringing. Someone was trying to help me out of the vehicle. When I got out, I saw a man holding Salem's car seat. His eyes flashed. The eyes from the night prior. Salem was laughing. I snatched my baby away from him, pulling her from the car seat so I could hold her to my chest. She immediately began sobbing. When I looked up from her, the man was gone. But when I looked into the fields, they didn't seem too empty.